This happened about seven years ago now. I was around 19 to 20 and I was a scout leader. We had a camp in a forest. The nearest city was about 10 to 15 minutes drive away. Now, every year in the month of July, we would have an international scout camp. Scouts from different European countries would join us. I was in the preparations team and we would go around two to three weeks in advance just to clean up and put the tents up and all that. In the preparation team, we had about maybe around 20 people, 10 to 12 men and the rest women. We were all in our late teens or early 20s. So if anyone has been a scout, you might know that the first thing in a camp is setting up a flag. The flag is an important part of this camping game. Other scouts would constantly try to steal the flag. If they managed to steal, then the lost team would have to go home. This never actually happened. No one was ever really sent home or anything. It was just a rule to keep other members involved and willing to protect the flag. Therefore, we had to constantly keep an eye or a guard out, a team member near the flag. Other games involved attacking other teams and kidnapping members. All fun and games, nothing violent or harsh or anything. And it was really fun and made us be alert like 24-7. But here is where the creepy story actually begins. So one night our preparation team was done with everything. The other two countries from Europe, about 60 people, were set to arrive in the morning. We really had nothing to do so we set up a campfire and started singing and talking and all that. We had our guards, people from the team, set up in different locations. Two near the flag, two near the entrance, and two in the woods facing the river. We were tired though and eventually we decided to go to sleep. We would change guards every two hours. Each guard had a whistle and if an animal or a person was to come to the camp, they would blow a certain note of a whistle as to alarm for danger. That night I was an hour into sleep when I heard a whistle. We all woke up and ran to the team member who had whistled and she claimed that she saw three white figures running quickly in the forest near the set up tents. We thought that the morning teams arrived early and sneaked in to steal the flag or kidnap a member or whatever. So we all decided to stay awake and go into the defense mode. We each stood guard in different locations watching for any signs and after some time we started hearing whistles from the deeper parts of the forest. We also started hearing radio sounds from different places. We saw some guys in white shirts running around in the forest. Me and two other people decided to check the empty tents to see if there were people hiding in the empty tents or anything but couldn't find anyone. Then we started walking around and we heard laughter from the bush near us. It sounded like a woman laughing so we started laughing too as we thought that we'd found the other scout team near the bush. Naturally we walked to the bush without any hesitation but to our horror there was nobody there. Then we heard more noises from another bush that was a little deeper into the woods then we heard a clear conversation between a few people speaking French, I think, in accent. We could hear them clearly, so we checked that again, but there was nothing. Then we saw a guy in a white t-shirt running fast again in front of us, but his speed was really weird. He was running so fast as if he was sliding almost. Keep in mind, we're in the woods at night with no lights, there's no way someone can just run without making a noise, but somehow this guy was running absolutely silently. It really seemed like he was sliding as well, which is weird, I know, but again, we still didn't feel threatened, I guess. We just had adrenaline rushing through us, but it was more excitement to catch them than anything else. After all, we just wanted some fun to begin with anyway. We were excited to see the teams again and have some fun, so... For the next two or so hours, we kept hearing whistles and whispers in French, but we just couldn't find a single person. It was so clear that there were a lot of people hiding around us, but we couldn't catch even one of them. They were just way too quick and also really sneaky as well. Also, an important point to mention is that the arriving teams were not from France, so it was weird to hear them speak in French, but... Anyways, after like two hours of running in the forest in the dark, I got tired eventually. I didn't take this too seriously, so myself and a couple of my friends went back into our tents to rest for a bit. 
I laid down and maybe after 10 minutes I saw a car light speeding towards us. This area is not really designed for regular cars to arrive or anything. None of us or other teams had cars as well. A bus from the near city would drop us there and pick us up after the camp was over, but we heard a car coming straight towards our tents with high beams on. It was coming so fast that we were frozen, expecting it to hit us at any moment. It happened so quickly that we couldn't even really run. Then suddenly it just stopped right near our tent. We heard the door open but heard no footsteps. Whoever it was just closed the door and then just left. We were shaking at that moment and it hit me that it couldn't have been anyone from the other teams. We got out and learned that our other teammates also had seen a jeep speeding towards our tent but didn't see anyone come out of the car. After this we just decided to stay awake until morning. Throughout the entire night we kept seeing these white shirted men sliding around us. Mind you, we couldn't see any faces, they were too quick and it was weird. We could hear loud laughters and French whispers all around our camp. We could tell that there were a lot of strangers near the camp who were either messing around with us or had plans to hurt us or something. In the end, the sun came up and the strange things just stopped. We didn't manage to catch anyone or figure out who they actually were. In the morning, the other teams arrived and we had this leaderboard meetings every afternoon where we would discuss daily plans and meals and all that. Also, we would share about any planned or failed attacks. And all the team leaders said that they arrived in the morning, so they were not even in the country at night. Up to this day, I have no idea who those people were. I have no idea what they wanted or what their plans were. They never attacked or kidnapped anyone in the team, but it was scary when I think of it. I mean, what would have happened if we hadn't have had our guards out that night? What would happen if we were all asleep? At the end of the day, this was a campsite in a wooded area, and woods can be places where cults and crazy people gather together, and my hunch is that it was something to do with this. So this was about three and a half years ago, but I think about it pretty much every day. I'll start by saying that I was not being very smart, and I know that. So, I was in Miami with a friend, who was now my boyfriend, and we were vacationing or blowing off some steam. I was 28, he was 25, we are both gay, and I decided to download Grinder and see what was going on. Long story short... I met a guy and went to his place for some fun. We had at it and I had a good time and we had some drinks. I was feeling great. It was about 11pm at night and time to wrap up and head back to the hotel. I saw that it was about a mile walk literally straight down the road so I head out. And well I had taken some Adderall and was feeling a little more reckless than I normally am and decided maybe I would hook up with somebody else. I know I know but... I log back on Grinder and instantly connect with a really hot guy. He invites me over, gives me his address, and also says that he could come and pick me up. So, I'm just standing there on the edge of this sidewalk, wondering if I'm going to get picked up, or call an Uber to this location, or just go home. And someone pulls up in a truck and says that they're here to pick me up. I'm like, oh wow, you came, that's really nice. I literally remember looking at the picture and at the guy, and feeling very confident that they were the same person, so I hopped in the truck. Instantly, though, I just had the weirdest feeling rush over me. The truck smelled weird, too, first of all. I don't know how to describe it, but it was like the taste of licking iron, maybe. I was instantly turned off and felt really weird about that, though. Anyway, he starts driving... Thankfully, I didn't close out the grinder app too when he pulled up because it was so abrupt because I looked down and literally noticed that I'm getting further away from the guy that I was talking to, which means that they were not the same person. 
but this guy looked exactly like this person. But the weirdest thing was that this guy looked exactly like the person's profile. I remember that I just started texting and talking, being like, I really like your blonde hair. Your grey truck is really cool. Is this a 2014 Chevy Silverado? I just told my friends about you and have to be home by 12pm, just FYI. But we can go to my hotel, they'd love to meet you if you'd like. Trying to make it seem like I have people waiting on me, that I disclosed parts of his identity, anything really. This lasted about two to three minutes until, eventually, he just pulled over and said that he wasn't feeling like hanging out anymore. I got out and he left and I got in an Uber and went home. To this day though, I really do think that I was picked up by someone who saw an easy target. But thankfully, I was slightly resourceful in the moment. Enough to get me out of, well, whatever that was. So, I'd like to tell you about an experience that I had recently that honestly disturbed me. I don't know if it was real, a, a nightmare, or something else, but I cannot explain it. So first of all, you need to know that my bedroom and my mother's bedroom are opposite each other. So from my door, I can see my mother's bedroom, which is at the end of the corridor. What's more, my window faces my door, and therefore my corridor. It was the middle of the night and the moon was shining brightly that night, so it was quite easy to see the bedroom and the corridor without too much difficulty. During the night, I woke up and was facing my window, curled up on top of myself. That was when I saw a face opposite my bed that I could well describe to you. It was a young man, I'd say in his twenties, with a fairly thin face and hollow cheeks, he had red hair, short with curls on top. The most terrifying thing about him though was that he was looking towards my bedroom door with a horrified look frozen on his face. I mean, he didn't move an inch as if it was a painting that I was seeing, but he looked so real. At that moment, I had a feeling of terror that ran through my body. I was still curled up and I didn't dare move or turn around towards my door where the young man was looking. My body was telling me not to move, my eyes were glued to the side and I just couldn't move. My body froze and I felt sick to my stomach and I had the feeling that if I moved, something serious was going to happen. I stayed like that for a few minutes and then at one point, it was completely calm, the young man was gone and it was quiet. Maybe a little too quiet, actually. Like the calm you feel when you realize what had just happened. After that, though, I couldn't contain myself from turning back towards my corridor. And that's when I caught sight of a silhouette. It was transparent, but it was as if you could see the outline of its silhouette. It's hard to explain, but the only thing that I know is that when I looked at this thing, I didn't feel at all comfortable and... I was even a little bit scared. After all of that, I didn't look far and went back to sleep as if nothing had happened. It wasn't until the next day that I thought about it again and I spoke to my mother about it, but she couldn't come up with an explanation either. And that's why I'm here. Do you guys have any idea what this could have been? As a teenager, I waited tables in a local restaurant to pay for the gas for my car. I met Mr. Creep there and in my naive mind he seemed normal at first, despite the fact that he was 20, wanting to date a 17 year old I guess, but leaving my job after dark scared me so I taught myself to get in my car, shut the door and lock in one fluid motion. It made me feel safe. Now one night I was leaving work and had just gotten into my car when Mr. Creep seemed to just appear out of nowhere, yanking on my door handle to try and open it. I looked into his eyes in the split second before he smiled, and what I saw absolutely chilled my bones. I don't know how to describe the evil that I saw, but 
It was unlike anything I've ever seen. From then on, I was terrified of him, but I didn't let on because I was afraid of what he might do if I told him that I never wanted to see him again. I had been dating this guy for a little while at this point. After this, he constantly lied to try and impress me and tried to invent ways of being alone with me, but my instinct was to run, so I just tried to avoid him. About two weeks after this incident, the restaurant got robbed and there was significant evidence against Mr. Creep, just not the kind that allowed the cops to charge him. I sent on my text conversations with Mr. Creep to the police chief in hopes that it would help. Mr. Creep slithered away after that, but I always looked over my shoulder. Anyway, about five years ago, he messaged me on Facebook out of the blue. He went on about his top secret military clearance as well as a huge acreage that he owned. It made me nervous and I felt like he was trying to spring a trap or something, but I tried to put it out of my mind thinking that I would never see him again. Then today I was looking at posts about an unsolved murder when I saw his mugshot. He was now facing murder charges as well as two other violent felony charges. I am so glad that he is now locked up but also really overwhelmed about how correct my instincts were about Mr. Creep. I feel like I escaped him. I feel like I just escaped being murdered. So I attended a community center for children in Brooklyn, New York, and I had to be no older than like six or seven. The center would take all the children on trips throughout the summer, and on one of our trips, there was this place in Manhattan, similar to Discovery Zone or a Chuck E. Cheese, but even bigger. I never could quite remember the name of the establishment. I'm guessing being that it was so long ago that the walls were interactive tablets or the children which had games on learning applications. But my brother saw it and he was glued there the entire time. There were ball pits and tubes as far as I could see. They looked like castles to me, like three separate sections. One section seemed to be closed off, I assumed being that the lights were dim in this particular area, so maybe the lights were busted or whatever. But anyway, I followed a group of older kids to see what they were up to, and honestly I had a crush on one of the girls, so I planned to let her know why we were there, but... I found her and the group of older kids at the top of one of the tub towers making out. It had me really bummed, so I left on my own and I decided to go to the section that was rather dim. There was a huge padded hill at the bottom, a ball pit with the rope above it, so I could just slide across and just sit there. I rolled my body down the ramp and when I looked up, right in front of my face was a young boy, laid face down, not moving at all. And at his feet and his head were two men dressed in all black suits, completely bald with black shades on. But what scared me the most were just how pale these men were. And they looked exactly alike as well, which was so weird. I knew then that I did not want to be the next kid that they got, so I just took off running and found my godbrother frantically trying to explain to him what I had just seen. But before I could even get it out, they made an announcement on the loudspeaker. And the next thing I know, my entire group had got kicked out of the place and they told the counselors that we were just too rowdy, which was completely untrue. The counselors thought that it was a race thing, but to be honest, I don't know about that. Maybe it was the fact that I had seen something that I shouldn't have. I never did tell anyone, I guess I ought to fear, but... Keep in mind that there was no Man in Black movies made back then, nor was the internet around like today, so I, at that time, had no idea what I was looking at. But in hindsight, those guys, they looked exactly how people describe the Man in Black. This happened to me a few years ago probably back in 2017 when I was 14. I still think about this encounter almost every day. So my dad lives near a small lake in Wisconsin. 
there are only about a hundred people who live in the neighborhood. My brother and I spent every other weekend up there, so we knew pretty much everyone. My dad's house was the second house to the top of this large hill, and at the very top is a gas station and the diner where I would work over the summer. At the bottom of the hill was the lake and a small beach. Now that morning I was waitressing at the diner and at the end of my shift I bought a slushie from the gas station and was planning on going down to the beach for the afternoon. Parked outside the diner was a gorgeous teal vintage car. I'm not sure what brand, I'm not really good with that stuff but it seemed to be from the 60s and it caught my eye. There was an older man in the driver's seat and his wife in the passenger seat too. They had their windows up and I wasn't too close so I didn't get a great look at them but I did notice that they were looking at me. I didn't think anything of it and started walking home. On my walk home I remember wondering where they could have been from. We don't get many tourists around here and I would have remembered if someone drove a car like that. Plus the diner was off a pretty quiet highway and it was rarely used by out of towners but I assumed that they were just driving through, I guess. My younger brother and I went to the beach that afternoon and hung out for a few hours. When we decided to head home, I packed up my stuff probably a minute before he did and started walking home before him. On the walk up the hill, there was probably half a city's block's distance between us. He could clearly see me, but we were too far to talk at this point. I heard a car coming towards me and... I looked back and moved to the side of the street. It was the car that I had seen earlier at the diner. They slowed down as they approached me and I started to get nervous at that. The woman in the passenger seat rolls down her window and I nearly wet myself. They both seemed to be wearing like hyper-realistic latex face masks. There seemed to be no beginning and no end to the mask. There weren't noticeable holes for eyes, yet their eyes definitely seemed real, and there was no seam at the edge of the neck or anything. If they were wearing masks, they were some of the best masks that I've ever seen and must have cost an absolute fortune, but it definitely wasn't their skin. I mean, there was no way. Something about them was just so off as well. Anyway, the woman asked me for directions to a highway that I've never heard of. I didn't drive yet though, so this in itself wasn't that weird, but I pointed them to the highway by the diner that leads out of town. They thanked me, rolled up the window, and drove away. I ran to my brother and told him what had happened, and he said that they looked pretty normal to him when they drove past him, but they looked normal to me that morning as well. The masks, though, were just too good. I mean, you had to be close enough to notice how strange they actually looked. There was just something really unsettling about them. They didn't really do anything odd except asking a girl who was clearly too young to drive for directions, I guess, but it was a very small community, and I might have been the first person that they'd seen in hours. Who knows, but it was just the way that they looked. I've never really seen anything like it, and I haven't seen anything like it since as well. I mentioned it to my dad when I got home, but he didn't have much to say about it. But I still feel really deeply unnerved when I think about it, more than six years later. I don't believe in much of the paranormal stuff, and I do think that they were human. At least, I think so. But why the masks? What were they doing there, and why ask a child who is obviously too young to drive for directions to a highway? Has anyone ever experienced something like this before? And if you have, I would really like to hear exactly what those masks were. I was reminiscing about when my dad and I used to download ghost hunting apps and run around his apartment complex for ghosts. So I re-downloaded one today, it's just called Ghost Hunting Tools or whatever. It's an EMF reader and spirit box, or supposedly is. Anyways, I had it open for about 15 minutes and the readings were relatively normal. Spewed out some random words every couple of minutes. 
I noticed when it would spit out a word, the energy levels would spike a bit before then, almost mimicking how I would imagine a spirit would draw energy or something. Like, it would build up and EMF levels would go up and then down, and once the word was out, it would go down again. I figured it was fake, but kept it open in the background. I decided to try a pendulum game with a bracelet that I read about online. It said to ask out loud what side is yes and all that. I kind of felt it go one side when I asked, so I confirmed with a question, do you understand? And I felt it almost definitely start to move to the side that it assigned to yes. I've never really had that happen before, like something move on its own like that. And it was around this point that I started to feel nervous. Something just wasn't right and I read that if I were to feel this way that I should end the game immediately by saying goodbye, so I did. I turned around to my phone, which was still open with the app on my bed. The EMF reader was now spiking at the highest level that I've ever seen. It was spitting out words within seconds of each other. When the entire time that I had it open, it spit only random words out every like couple of minutes. But the weird thing was that I got actual sentences. Like, I got words together like, near you, shoot, Diablo. I immediately held up the pendulum again and said sternly, I said goodbye. And immediately, the levels went down and the scary messages stopped. Which, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but that was definitely weird. I wasn't even sure that this was real and I'm starting to think that it was. I really don't know how to explain this and I'm scared that I didn't do enough to ward away whatever I may have been in communication with. So I'm here to ask all of you guys, what should I do? So this happened after a whole other crazy experience, attempting to sleep on a church stoop along 250W that was beside a graveyard. And while that's a story for another day, it's the reason that I broke my own rule. To fall asleep at dusk and wake up at dawn, only travel during daylight. I made this rule because it's dangerous enough to walk alongside highways during the day and would be worse at night was not thinking about paranormal activity at all. But yeah, the graveyard incident gave me such an enormous spook that I took off running and was back on the highway. By this time, it was pitch black, no street lamps and almost no cars as well, no houses or any sign of civilization either. I finally got to a point that my heart stopped pounding and was walking at a steady, relaxed pace, hoping to find somewhere to camp for the night. Then I saw something that kind of looked like a ghostly white human face a couple of feet above ground, right behind the metal bumper or fence a, a few yards ahead of me. I looked away though, thinking that it was just my poor eyesight playing tricks on me. But when I was right beside it, I realized it was very much a face, solid and ghost white, empty black sockets in a place of eyes, with human-like features, but the face was way too long to be human. I started to run and it jumped over the railing. Picture that face that I described on a matching all-white body that was the size of a large dog with the gait of a deer and either horns or antlers as well. I wasn't able to get a good look because I was screaming bloody murder at this point, sprinting away from it as it was galloping after me. About 20 yards of sprinting later, I was running so fast that my legs couldn't keep up and I did a kind of nosedive into the pavement. It gave me some of the nastiest road burn that I've ever had, and I needed hospitalization after infection weeks later. In any case, I scrambled back on my feet, glanced over my shoulder to see it jumping back over the railing, disappearing into the brush. Not far away was a driveway to a house where, eventually, I fell asleep. To my surprise, the owner of the house did not call the police when she found me in the morning. Instead, she drove me all the way to a homeless shelter in a, a valley town called Staunton. I told her and a bunch of other shelter residents the story to ask if they knew what it was. All I got was people telling me, yeah, I've lived out there my whole life and seen plenty of things I can't explain, but without ever really answering the question. 
One guy told me about the not deer, but I looked that up and it did not line up with what I saw at all. This happened over a year ago now, and to be honest, I'd mostly forgotten it, I suppose, but now what's really bothering me is my partner and I are considering getting a house in Blue Ridge area. I want to know what it was, other places it might live, what attracts or repels it so that I can definitely try to avoid another encounter at all costs. A couple of years ago, there was a problem that I used to have. I would constantly lose items in my room. Like, my room is not cluttered at all. It's mostly plain, really, and almost barren, in fact. Yet, I would constantly lose things, even if I placed it down in places that I knew for a fact that it would be there. It got to the point where I started blaming my brother or roommate. I mean, the way that these items would disappear would be baffling and infuriating. I already believed in the supernatural, but this seemed like someone was pranking me, to be honest. I blamed my brother a lot, and he constantly denied it. Until two separate incidences of missing items took place. There was a, a shirt that I only wore at home and never outside. I lost it one day, and of course I blamed my brother in an infuriating rant. A couple of days later, I went to work, and... I saw the shirt folded up, dusty on top of a locker. I honestly genuinely got scared and nearly panicked to my core at that point. Because I never ever wore my home shirt to work considering that I have a work shirt as well. And in the end, I didn't take the shirt out of paranoia and I just left it there. I came back home and told my brother about it and he was weirded out but not scared. I forgot about it until the second incident. Me and my brother were going to see V's to pick up some snacks and considering this missing item dilemma that we were going through, me and my brother right before we entered the door of the CVs agreed to check our wallets for our debit cards. We pulled it out, showed it to each other and we headed home. We got our items, headed to self-checkout, I reached into my pocket and the wallet was gone. I looked at my brother and he patted me down and we searched every nook and cranny that we could think of just in case we didn't misplace it somewhere. But in the end, we just couldn't find it at all. But my brother just looked at me bewildered. We asked one of the employees to check the camera and they did, but they said that they couldn't find anything on it. We went back home talking about it on the way. I go back inside my room, flip the lights on, and you know what I see on my bed? Wrapped in a circle on my bed? Like a sick joke? My wallet. I stood there for a good minute, trying to logic my way to this conclusion. I showed my brother, and to this day, we have no explanation for this. Thankfully, I don't lose things in this weird manner anymore, strangely enough, but... This wallet scenario has always stuck with me, and so with my brain trying to still figure out what happened, I'm wondering, has anyone else had this happen to them? And if it did, did it ever come back? So, I'm a believer in the supernatural and have been all my life. I've always had experiences or feeling like I'm being watched, having perplexing dreams of entities that felt too real as something as well, or feeling an energy that either was or wasn't happy as something as well. Now, this experience I'm going to talk about is by far the most intense and outstanding experience that I've ever had, and to be frank, I never would have even dreamed of experiencing it. So... Back in spring of 2020, it was an average night as I was doing what I usually did. Watching YouTube, scrolling through my phone as I wind down from the day and get ready for bed. Nothing out of the ordinary and no foreign or unsettling energies were present. Time goes by, it's time for bed. I get cozy and start getting sleepy. A couple of minutes go by, give or take, and... I'm starting to notice that it's getting really cold and not just, huh, it's a little chilly type cold. 
I'm talking freezing, down to like zero degrees type cold, which never happens where I live, especially on the countryside during spring. But it was absolutely freezing. I was shaking it was so cold and I could see my breath now too. I could tell that something was way off so I sit up and am instantly hit with this intense presence of being in the corner of my room to the right of my bedroom door. Now, my room isn't very big. I would estimate 6 by 12 so if you were in here with me, it'd take less than like one step to get to the other side. This thing, I could feel it standing there just staring at me, unmoving as it took me in and I took it in. I could see this thing clear as day in my head, a perfect image as if it showed itself to me. And boy, it was not pretty. First, its skin was black as the void itself. No other colors were present. Its face was nothing but two hollowed out holes in a black contorted skull. No other features but empty sockets. Its body and limbs were thin, malnourished to the fullest extent, being like twigs. Along with its arms and legs being abnormally long, this thing was standing at, I would estimate to be about 8 foot tall. Despite this thing being a demon or whatever, it seemed to hold no hostilities towards me. It just stood there, looking at me until maybe 20 or 30 minutes pass and it finally leaves. The temperature instantly warms up, there's no more presence and I'm alone once more. Weirdly, it didn't shake me up as much as it did astonish me, I guess, being so close to such an otherworldly thing, let alone its center of attention. And look, I know that this is a fairly out there and extremely boggling experience, but if anyone else has had a similar experience, then please do let me know. It would be nice to know that I'm not the only one who has had something like this happen to them, because it certainly sticks with you when it does. I work overnight at a 24-hour diner. You can probably guess what company, but I'm used to weird people and odd things happening, I guess. But tonight was just too much. The restaurant backs up to a field that has a tree line, and my cook and I went out back to take a smoke. We could hear someone yelling in the distance, but we do have a lot of homeless people that come through town that usually are harmless, so we just shrugged it off as weird and went back inside. Later on, I came out again to smoke and throw away some trash in the dumpster that is next to the field. It was stupid to go over to it, but I hadn't heard him again. But as I'm walking away from the dumpster, I hear, Hey, come here. Hey, come here. It was much closer than we had heard him yelling the first time. I went inside and got my co-worker who owns a car with a spotlight on it. We shined it out into the field, which again was not that smart and we admit that, but we just couldn't see where he was. But he kept saying, hey girl, come here. I called the cops by this point because it was just too weird. As soon as I get off the phone with them, he comes walking out of the field He's an older man wearing a tan trench coat and my coworker and a customer ran back inside because this dude was hauling butt across the parking lot. He started to come towards the door and I called the cops again. My cook cut him off and told him that he needed to go. The man was acting really erratically, yelling at my cook and said, I'll end your life next time I see you. He kept moving his jacket by his waist like he was flashing a weapon but... I couldn't see anything from inside. The cops get him down the road and an officer came by and basically said that the guy was homeless and not mentally stable. <sighs> no kidding. We told them everything that happened and my cook pressed charges on him. The officer told us that there wasn't anything that they could really do and he wouldn't give her his name so in the end they just let him go. Basically ended with... Oh, by the way, he's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye. He came back, though, again hauling butt across the neighborhood parking lot and back into the field. We could hear him screaming, yelling, Hey, come here again and again. 
we got busy when the bars closed and haven't heard him yelling since, but I know that he's still back there because I had caught him sleeping behind the dumpster before. My manager comes in in the morning and I'm going to try and get her to let me take a picture of him of the security tape so that I can warn the other third shift workers. The field that he's camping out in also backs up to a middle school but the cops said again that there was nothing that they could do. Hopefully he moves on and just leaves us alone or the cops can get him on something where no one gets hurt but at this point it's not looking good. So me and my husband decided to go to a lookout spot that is known for paranormal. It's called Dover Lights. It's known for colored orbs that will fly around in the sky with no particular pattern. They are apparently all different colors as well and I've seen them twice. Scientists have come and can't find any explanation for them. But that's not what this is about. This place is deep in a wooded area and on top of a mountain that you can see for miles when you get to the top where the lookout is. It's about a 45 minute to an hour drive from our home. We left a little after 11 p.m. and it was a pretty clear night that night. Well, by the time that we reached our destination at the top, a huge storm had come out of pretty much nowhere. It was lightning and thundering and raining really hard as well. It had been my idea to go there, but as soon as my husband turned off the truck, I was stuck with a fear. I began to cry and told him that I wanted to go. He asked me why, and I just kept telling him that I didn't know why, but I didn't want to be there anymore. So we started to drive back down the winding dirt road. About halfway down the mountain, lightning struck. It was so close that I jumped to the floorboard of the truck and my husband threw on the brakes. I said, what the heck? He said that the lightning nearly hit the truck at that point. I climbed back up onto my seat as he began moving again and I spotted something glowing red about maybe 15 feet into the woods. I couldn't pull my eyes away because it felt like it was looking at us too. It was completely black except for its red eyes it had something similar to pointing bat-like ears and wings that were tucked behind on its back, but you could see them over its shoulder, its pointy wings. It was about three and a half foot tall and was in mid-stride when we spotted it. It was the feeling that it brought with it that was so scary I felt heavy, thick darkness, like the whole world had gone dark black sort of feeling, and that's the only way to explain it like nothing I'd ever felt before or afterwards. It felt like something was poking around in my head as well, and I now realized that whatever it was, I think it was trying to read my thoughts, but couldn't and was slightly annoyed by that. I really don't know how else to explain that feeling as well, but my eyes and its eyes were still locked. It was only a few seconds, but it seemed like time just wasn't even moving. As we continued driving past, neither one of us, me or my husband, said anything for a few seconds. Quietly, without looking at my husband though, I whispered, Did you see that? He looked at me and said, You saw it too? I said yes, and then he looked at me and said, What the heck was that? We were driving fast now, trying to get out of these woods and away from that mountain. I said that it was a demon, I think, and my husband doesn't much believe in things like that, but he said that he never wanted to think or talk about it ever again. It scared him, and I could tell. He doesn't get scared by much, but he just didn't know what it was, I guess, and his words were, it was nothing good, and not from this world. We've talked about it every now and then, and we even thought about it later, it was just a few seconds after that lightning had almost struck our truck as well and that had to be somehow connected to it. It was too weird for the lightning and then for a second later that thing to appear like that mid-stride in the woods. It wasn't just coincidence is what I'm getting at. I'm pretty firmly committed too that it was a demon because the feelings that surrounded it were dark and turned everything dark around it as well. I just want to know, though, what demon it would be, I guess. 
I've looked for years now online and never found anything that looked like it. I'm also thinking that those pointy ears were actually black horns and maybe not ears at all. It didn't have any features on its face, just the eyes glowing red, pointy wings folded back and all black. It had two legs obviously because it was walking on them. It was about three and a half feet tall but it was absolutely terrifying. It seemed intelligent too because it saw us and it was thinking just like we were. I could tell by its eyes. I don't know how I know that but I just do and... Maybe it told me in a way that it just popped into my mind or whatever. Whatever the case, it seemed just as intelligent as we are. Actually, perhaps even smarter than we are, I suppose. But anyway, could anyone else please tell me if they know about this creature, maybe? The place is Dover Lights, and I think it might be a place for things to pass through easier, like a portal or something. If you know anything else that might be helpful as well, then please do let me know. I'm truly very curious to find out why we came across this thing and if it came through with the lightning or something. I know that this all sounds crazy, but if you've been through something like this, then you know how just disconcerting it really is. This happened last winter. Fog starts setting in my city at the time of sunset and it gets really dark pretty quickly here. Now, my university has a policy of not interfering in anything that happens outside, even if it's right outside the gate in front of the guards and all that. And a few days before my stare down, there was some talk going around about a student's phone getting snatched right outside of uni or whatever. One day though, me and my boyfriend were sitting in the car outside, right beside the college wall and around 20 meters away from the college gate. He wanted to use the restroom and asked me to come inside with him, but I was like, oh, nah, I'm just too tired and you go and I'll wait here. So he went, leaving his phone with me. I was using my phone sitting inside on the full brightness setting when suddenly a bike beeline towards the car the two men sitting on it had those ski masks on and started tapping the car window on the driver's side with a gun. It's important to note that the passenger side where I was sitting was right beside a gutter so they couldn't come too close to me. They backed off and again came forward tapping the window, looking at me through the windshield and motioning for me to roll down the window. But honestly, I was way too stunned to do anything and eventually they just drove away when they saw other people approaching, when they saw other people approaching. All I wanted to do was save my boyfriend's phone, which was under my thigh, so mission accomplished, I guess. But sometimes I wonder if those people hadn't have showed up when they did, what might have actually happened. As a Muslim, we believe that those entities that anyone encounters, such as ghosts, poltergeists, apparitions, etc., they're all jinn, and some of them just are there to scare people for the sake of pranking. Others, though, are absolutely evil and might literally harm you, like scratching or perhaps even worse. With that said, a long time ago, I was staying at a relative's house. He was my uncle. He had a wife and two kids and they had a decent house, nothing big or anything. But keep in mind that the apartment is on the ground floor and you might hear kids playing or yelling outside. They keep the window open quite often as well but anyway, I was there alone at some point and they had gone out to the mall with my mother. I didn't want to join because it would have been boring to join them so I decided to stay and just play video games that day and the night started pretty fine. Some time passed though and that was when I started hearing some noises, like kids talking. I brushed it off though as I thought that it could have been some of the kids outside as I mentioned before. But I kept hearing it louder and louder and I went to check the window but there wasn't a single person outside. So I decided to shut the window and go back to my game. Some time passed and I started hearing children talking and yelling. This time though it was a little bit louder again, as if 
someone was inside the house. At that, I got startled and I began to check around, only to find absolutely nothing. When I sat down again and I went back to playing, the noises started up again. This time it was getting louder and louder as well and I had a headset back then and I put it on. It was connected to the monitor so that I could hear the game. The noises became so loud that even with the headset on I could still hear it. And mind you, I was completely terrified at this point. And just like that, the noises just stopped all of a sudden. And it was then that I felt someone pulling the back of my shirt up. I jumped up like I've never jumped before and I just ran out of the house. From that day on too, I never went back to that house again. And when I opened the door, I found my father outside of the house about to ring the door. He looked at my face and asked what was wrong. I told him the story, but he didn't believe me. However, he told me not to bring that up to my relatives so I wouldn't be disrespectful. When I saw my mother, I told her the story, and by the look on her face, I could tell that she believed every word that I had said. Because later I found out that my relatives used to do seances in this house, and even his wife and children used to experience stuff too. Needless to say, that was one of the most terrifying experiences that I have ever had. And since then, I tried my best to never get scared of encounters like that. I've had other experiences after that, such as noises and taps and similar stuff, but I learned that if you pay them no mind and you don't show any fear, that eventually they just leave you alone. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my story and it's certainly something that sticks with me. I really hope too that nothing like this ever happens again. I lived in a haunted house at a really early age, though despite this my memory remains fresh of most of these encounters. We were there for a year so... I must have been three or four during this. I lived with my older brother, older than me by three years, younger sister, younger by three years, so just a baby at that time, mother and father. The house looked overgrown. The thin vines grew on the walls, large bushes in front of the windows, and it was fenced in the front with a large gate circling the backyard. The hauntings, though, they started pretty quickly. My mum, for instance, would hear heavy boot stomps up the stairs, despite nobody being there. My father would get locked out of the house despite nobody being inside. And my brother would hear doors opening, but I definitely got the worst of it. I was looking out of my window, watching my mother go to work. She had a double shift, and my dad wasn't the best of dads, to put it lightly. But I stared until I noticed a large pitch black snake following her to her car. The snake looked to be double her in length, despite its slithering, thus curling its body. My mother is 5'8", which makes the snake probably around 11 foot long, but it had followed her for a couple of minutes until she had gotten into her car. Then it slithered back into the bushes near my window. I looked down to see it looking right at me. Despite this, though, I would still go outside and play like other kids. Playing in the backyard till dusk, my brother and I were playing separately. My brother, loving sports, ran around throwing a football, whereas I played with one of my toy animals. The one toy in specific was a big T-Rex that I had. The T-Rex looked like one of the older renditions before Jurassic Park, upright with its tail dragging the ground. And as the sun set further, our mother called us inside for dinner. So we went inside and I noticed that I had left my toy and went to go and get it. It was dark to the point where I couldn't really make out the noticeable color but not too dark so as I couldn't see outlines and the detail of objects and all that. And I noticed the T-Rex chilling right by the tree where I had left it. I went to go and pick it up only for it to crumble because it was dirt in the shape of the T-Rex. I got freaked out at that and I ran back inside. Now, notice earlier that I said that I can remember most of these encounters. 
But the reason why I point this out is because my father said that he'd often see me sitting in the corner of my room or in the front of a blank screen. He'd ask me what I was doing and I would simply say that the old man told me to. I have no recollection of these happening, but my father swears up and down that this happened more than a few times. But this last one was definitely the most horrific. So, waking up in the middle of the night, I heard footsteps. Luckily, my TV was on, so I still had some light. But thinking that it was my dad, I got up to go to see him. But when I opened the door, there was just an old man standing there. He looked down at me and honestly looked corpse-like. I freaked out and I banged on my mother's bedroom door. She opened it and I hollered about how there was an ugly man in the house. She took it as someone actually breaking in and she picked me up with one hand and had a bat in the other and basically ran around the house, turning every light on and cussing loud enough to worry some of our neighbors. But in the end... We never found anyone in the house. I still very much remember though looking at that guy and he was real, like as real as my mum was and I just cannot explain it. Anyways, those are my encounters from this place that I've always found the scariest and the ones that have always stuck with me the most. So, I don't believe in ghosts or paranormal stuff. I think that most of the stuff that you read online or you hear about is fictional or made up. But, with that said, here is my experience from working at an elder care. So my shift always ended 11pm, so at 10.30pm, the corridors are always silent and dark, everyone is asleep, and we're just sitting in our office and sipping some tea, me and my colleague. We have motion detectors in every room installed and they're connected to our working phones and we can see live feed from the phones as well. All of a sudden though, at 10.35, I get a notification of movement in a patient's room. I was only 19 and I told my other colleague that there is no way in heck that I'm going in there to check it out on my own. At the beginning, I wasn't expecting much to be honest because patients do move at night so it's pretty normal. What we did instead was we opened our phone to see the image that was taken when the movement was detected and upon opening the app I see a picture of a weird object in the middle of the room. Whatever it was, it was kind of floating. The object cannot be described because, I mean, it had legs and wide in the middle. I don't know if it had a head but I froze and my colleague did too. I took screenshots we ran to the room and when we went inside, the patient was sleeping and nobody was in the middle of the room. The morning after, I showed the images to my bosses and they couldn't believe it. But they were not shocked either. They say that it's elder care and apparently it's a haunted place. I don't know if I still have the pictures, but even if I did, I doubt that I could share them because the picture shows the identity of the patient as well. Also, the section I worked in was only for people with severe dementia and they couldn't walk. So, there was that too. I was in Venice this time last year and I still cannot get my head around how and why this happened. So, I was there for three nights. It was my first time in Venice and I loved it. I was there with friends, but due to our poor planning, all four of us stayed in different hotels. I chose one near the station, which was an intimate hotel, ran by a religious family. It was a classic old villa facing a canal, and the place had a chapel as well, a garden, and full of religious merch and decorations throughout. My room was on the second floor. You had to climb three sets of stairs, and on the top you were met with a marble square lobby with a round table in the middle. There were four rooms around this lobby and the rest of the rooms continued on two corridors that stretched on either side of the lobby. My room was one of the rooms attached to this lobby, a single room that looked over the canal. 
It was a simple, small room composed of a single bed with a cross above the head, a basin, and a wardrobe. It was a cheap and cheerful hotel, and I slept like a baby the first two nights I was there. But on my third and final night, I had trouble getting to sleep, and the loud neighbor who was watching videos didn't help, but I had to bang on their wall around 1am after which they stopped and I fell asleep. But I remember feeling uneasy and agitated that night for some reason. I eventually woke up sometime around 3.30 to 4.30, which wasn't unusual for me as I don't sleep that well. But that was when I heard a group of loud wailing people in the building. It echoed into my room via the hall. At this point, I remember thinking that the source of this noise was either coming from the stairs or the bottom of it. I was initially annoyed, thinking that there were a bunch of drunkards who came in after night out or whatever. Then it suddenly hit me that the hotel had a 12am curfew. It was unlikely a group of people suddenly coming out of their rooms to cause a commotion as well. Eventually, I came to my senses, which made me more aware of this mysterious wailing. It was loud, almost in despair, and crescendoed over and over, echoing into the lobby. I eventually realized that this was, or they were, definitely not human. It's hard to explain, but something in me knew by the sound that whatever this was was not alive, in one form or another and humans could just not really make this noise. I have never, ever felt like this before, and it was a strange experience, but then the wailing finally stopped. I was relieved, but what happened next is something that I will never forget. The sound resumed, but this time from the foot of my bed. This thing or these things were wailing in my room at the foot of my bed, very much present, closer, and louder. I don't know what happened after that because as soon as I heard them, I just blacked out or passed out and I woke up on the floor at around 7 in the morning. To my surprise, I didn't feel as scared until later on in the day where I tried to recap what on earth happened. To this day, I still cannot explain what this was. I wasn't a paranormal enthusiast or believer and believed I would stay this way until proven wrong, I guess, but I'm pretty easily spooked, I suppose, and always thought that I'd end up crying or screaming if I encountered a ghost. My theory is that my body just went into extreme fear after this thing came into my room and simply shut down, hence the passing out. I do think about this pretty often, though, and I always get chills when I think about it. I'd love to hear what everyone here thinks about this though, thoughts, theories, etc. I've never gone back to that place and I don't intend to either, but if you live around there or if you've had any experience with things around there then I would love to know. This happened to me last year. So I was up late working on an art project in my living room, the windows wide open. I lived in the first floor apartment. Very often too I felt as if something or someone was watching me. And it knew that I knew and I got the feeling that I was not supposed to know, if that makes sense. It felt like someone was directly outside of my window though, staring straight at me, unwavering. Anyway, it was probably about one or two in the morning at this point when I heard what sounded like a very distant cry for help from a woman. This calling was so quiet that it was just barely audible. That's how far away it sounded. But at the same time, I couldn't shake this eerie feeling that it was actually quite close. It was really confusing and I chalked it up to exhaustion and that it was probably all in my head. But then, just as the screaming stopped, I heard a voice, so clear, so close, so haunting, whispered directly into my ear. I could almost feel their cold breath and it said, I know you can hear me. This voice, although only a whisper, echoed throughout the room. It was 
so articulate as well. I mean, there was no mistaking that it was a message whatsoever, undeniable, and that whatever this thing was, it was right there next to me and I could hear it. Every now and then I think about this and it always chills me to the bone, even a year later afterward. This was like nothing I'd ever experienced in my entire life. And even now I can't fully articulate the fear that shook me to my core because of this. The juxtaposition of it all too, like the distant screams were so quiet, but that was the loudest whisper that I'd ever heard. And I can assure you that there was absolutely nobody there. I want to tell my sister's potentially paranormal story from about four years ago. It's the most potent story that I've heard from somebody that I know personally. So, she was working in the cafe at Chorton House in Hampshire, UK, a grade two listed manor house. It has a Wikipedia page if you want to check it out. It was the evening, I must have been working an event or something, and she was upstairs alone when the door... Now, this is a big 300 plus year old heavy wooden door, so I think we can discount the wind catching it, swung open and closed again, except nobody walked in. What makes it creepier is that this door is key coded, so there's really no way of opening it unless the code is typed in. Clearly, this made my sister slightly nervous as she had heard that the house was haunted before but she carried on with what she was doing on the till. But then, the till started working by itself, buttons being pressed erratically and whatever she did, she just couldn't stop it. At this point, she started to really panic. She hates the paranormal. When the manager walked in, she took my sister outside into the yard to try and calm her down and explain the old classic, oh yes, that's Lady XYZ of the house and she likes to roam the floor. When all the old style outdoor lights in the yard started to dim and come back again. Well, that was the last straw for my sister, so she told the manager to heck with this, handed over her apron and bolted down the long driveway back to her car in the dark. I asked her, but weren't you scared to run down that driveway in the dark after all of that? And she replied, no, I just wanted to get the heck away from that place. It's something that we still talk about often and whenever I think about it, it always bothers me. I rescued a pit bull from a neglectful family. She was skin and bones when she came home and extremely submissive. After a, a week of love, affection and food, she was the most amazing dog that I'd ever met though. The softest, cuddliest baby who wouldn't even play fight with me unless she was under a blanket and did not know that it was me. I needed to do a quick late night run to my local shop one night. There's a 40 minute round trip route on main roads with houses or a 15 minute round trip route through an alleyway that wraps around the back of a school field. This alleyway has no street lamps, but I had never heard of anything bad happening, so I really didn't think too much of it. I set out with my dog in tow, and just before we reached the entrance, she stood still as a rock. I gently tried to usher her to follow me, but for some reason she refused. When I took my headphones off, I realized too that she was softly growling now and that I could hear a group of male voices coming from the alleyway. They soon came close enough to where I could see them and I think there must have been around five or six of them. This was during COVID mind you so they were all wearing masks with their hoods up. My mum always told me that if I found myself in a situation like this to not act scared, being scared shows that you're an easy target. So with that in mind, I tugged firmly on my dog's lead to get her to follow me. She stuck to my side, literally pressing her body against my leg as I walked. Yeah, it was awkward. I tried very hard to walk normally, but it was difficult. But she was quietly growling the whole time. The men had stopped and were standing slightly off the path to one side at this point. 
They were also talking quietly amongst themselves as we walked by. I couldn't really hear much as my heartbeat was pounding in my ears and my gut was screaming at me at this point. But once I knew that I was at a point where the darkness of the alley made me essentially invisible, I heard one of them raise their voice slightly and say, Nah, that's a pit, in a way that sounded like he was disagreeing. Now, I admit that they could have just been discussing the breed of my dog, but the gut feeling I had while walking past and for the duration of my walk through the alley makes me believe otherwise. I do think that these men were discussing possibly robbing me or perhaps even worse, and my soft baby who was literally scared of her own reflection deterred them due to her being an aggressive breed. It's safe to say too that we walked a long way home after that and I never went back there. I, a 28-year-old female, am a dog walker or pet sitter. Some of the dogs that I walk have reactivity, as did this one dog, a pit lab mix. She used to be a bad puller, along with being incredibly reactive to other dogs on leashes as soon as she'd see them. Through lots of work and training with her, she's come a long way with her reactivity to the point that it really is not an issue anymore even when another owner's carelessness allows their dogs to get too close for comfort. Now, on this one walk, she was a dream the whole time. Past multiple dogs without issue, she would just look at me for her treat. She knew that she would get if she was good. But we turned down a side street, though, that looked completely vacant at the time, so I could give her some more relaxed walking time. And all went well for a while. Not a soul in sight, until there was. Now... While I'm usually very good at keeping my head on a swivel, as some of my walks are not in the safest areas of the city, this guy definitely took me by surprise. I really don't know how he did it too, but he got about two to three feet behind us without my dog or me knowing that he was even there, and all of a sudden, shouted something unintelligibly. I could really only make out the last two words, your dog, Immediately though, my dog, with no prior history of human reactivity, got between us and started growling, snapping and lunging aggressively at this guy. I'm a smaller woman at 5'3", and this guy was at least 6'7", and incredibly muscular. As soon as he saw my dog trying to attack him, and me struggling to hold her back, he threw his arms up and bolted across the street without another word. He disappeared shortly after, around a corner. I have never praised a dog for reactivity like that, until that very moment. I gave her all the treats that I had left in my pocket, took her home and told her owner what had just happened and how her dog might have just saved my life. Of course, I hope that I'm wrong and the guy was just slow with social cues, but either the dog or I got that impression. Needless to say, she is by far my favorite client dog. I go on walks with her still every week, but we haven't gone down the street again while there are no people about. I am beyond blessed to have her and get to walk her weekly, but I do hope that I never see that guy again. This happened seven years ago when I was just a little bit more naive and 30 pounds lighter. Still just as short though. It was a week before Christmas and I was finishing up shopping or something. My mother, aunt and nana are all big into lottery so I tend to get some scratch tickets and season tickets as gifts. I don't gamble really so it's my one time buying them in a year. I always go to the same place too, down the street from me, and I wouldn't say that I live anywhere dangerous by any means. Not gated community level, but like a solid children can walk around alone in the dusk out of ten sort of thing. Now, I had an old SAAB that was the classic no one can drive her but me level of finicky. Sometimes she just wouldn't start unless you held the brake and sort of shifted through the gears a bit went to park, pushed really hard, and then turned the key. It took forever to figure that special secret handshake out, by the way. The roof needed to be manually put up, like it fell on your head sometimes, if you put it down. Not a design feature, and just a lot of sort of wonky stuff, I guess. 
My brother, who is a, a lunatic with toxic rage issues, but that's a whole different story, had broken the handle on my passenger side door right before this, after picking him up from scaring children at the hospital, so you couldn't open that door at all anymore. To get to the passenger side, you were either dukes of hazarding it, or you'd have to go through my side. So, it's Christmassy, a bit of snow and sludge, but pretty normal day. I go to the gas station to get the tickets, cash only, so enough money to make my purchases in hand. There are a few people behind me in line and a few playing Kino in the sitting area. There's also one wiry guy behind me to the side in line, but I didn't notice much other than that he was a little closer than I would personally have liked. In any case, I make my purchases, several $20 scratch tickets. They don't want anything less, bad odds apparently. Anyway... A couple of year-long season tickets and everything adds up to just over $400. Ouch. I pay the cashier and I head out to my janky little SAAB. I sit down, close my door, don't lock it, and begin to count or sort of organize my change and everything. When not even 35 seconds later, the wiry man comes out, walks to my car, and as he does, he stalls just for a second and tries my passenger side handle. It doesn't work and just makes a clunk as the handle is sort of free moving and doesn't connect to any mechanical stuff at this point. But my heart dropped and my stomach got really sour. My body knew to panic but my head hadn't caught up yet. He immediately keeps going, walking out of the parking lot and down the sidewalk. And it wasn't until I thought about it later and told some people that I really didn't even consider that the man was probably going to try and rob me or maybe even worse. I now very religiously follow the 45 second rule and I am a lot more vigilant during Christmas shopping. I've had several paranormal experiences in my lifetime, both personally and professionally, but I'm going to discuss the professional paranormal experiences at this point. Now, I was a surgical technologist in labor and delivery for about 10 years. I worked for a non-for-profit Catholic hospital for almost four years out of that 10. When I first started in the department, the two techs that had already worked there for a very long time, their names are M and J and myself K, told me stories about Sister Mary Margaret, who apparently was a surgery tech back when the hospital was still run by nuns. Needless to say, Sister Mary Margaret was very much by the book and left little room for her co-worker's errors. Jay knew about Sister Mary Margaret, but Em had worked there for so long that she actually worked with the nun. Em began to tell tales about instances when she'd heard Sister Mary Margaret in the OR suite long after she'd passed away and up to the current time frame. Being a born skeptic, I thought Em and Jay were just hazing the new girl I wasn't buying a bit of their nonsense. Well, fast forward to when I'm off of orientation and working my 12-hour night shifts. I'd been in the back setting up the OR suite or stocking supplies and I could hear the shuffle of shoe covers. Just as high heels make that sort of clack-clack sound. There is a, a very distinct sound that shoe covers make when they shuffle along the hospital floor like that. I, I just sleuthed it out of there though and... I figured that M and or J put one of the night shift nurses up to pranking me just to see if I'd fall for it. And well, I just had to hop out of there, catch them in the act and let them know that they weren't fooling anybody. So I popped out into the hallway, ready to scare the scrub pants off of whoever was pranking me, but when I jumped out into the hallway, nobody was there. There was no movement in the hallway, swinging of the doors, chatter on the intercoms, nothing. I was really perplexed by that initially. But being the first incident, I just kind of shrugged it off and I just went on working. As time passed though, these incidents became more and more frequent. We had more new employees and M&J and were training them. Me and her new orientee had an incident where sterile supplies were on the OR bed and a bulb syringe floated from the top of the supply pile at a 90 degree angle for about a minute and then just dropped to the floor. I really began believing them too when they relayed that story to me during report. 
I could tell that they were both honestly shaken up by the ordeal and I actually felt pretty bad for them. They were scared and trust me, these two were not actresses by any means. There was no way that they could have given such an Oscar-worthy performance like that. In any case, I continued having my own encounters with shuffling shoe covers, unintelligible whispering, all of the hallmarks of a, a typical haunting. Some of my tech co-workers continued reporting the same kind of activity. None of the activity was as egregious as what Em and her orientee experienced with the floating bulb syringe in midair. But then it all stopped being amusing to me when I went to the OR suite at about 2.30 or 3 in the morning to stock linens and sterile water and saline into the warmer. I'd done this a hundred times before. It wasn't anything new by any means. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with hospital warmers, they are the equivalent to leaving the hospital and going straight to Narnia. These miraculous inventions are what makes your hospital blankets so nice and toasty. We also put sterile water and saline in the top portion of the warmer to heat up liquids used externally so the patient doesn't get hypothermic. To give you a visual, it literally looks like an industrial-sized stainless steel refrigerator, I guess. It performs in the same way, except instead of making everything cold, it warms everything up, thus the hospital warmer. So I had taken the linen cart and some water and saline bottles with me to stock up everything. I left the cart in the hallway outside of our two surgical suites. The warmer was in between both OR suites and a little cubby besides our crash cart. And as you probably very well know, hospitals are known for migraine-inducing bright lights. This was one of the few things that I disliked about working in a hospital, in fact. Whenever I was able, I'd spare the blinding fluorescent lights as much as possible. So I proceeded to stock the warmer without turning lights on to spare myself the glare whenever I could. The OR suites were darkened and shadowy, but I could easily see to get around. I'm sure everybody familiar with refrigerators or freezers already is aware that the refrigerator part is pretty cold and the freezer part is obviously frozen cold. Well, the warmers at the hospital basically work on the same premise. The refrigerator part warms the blankets while the freezer part makes the external water and saline bottles really toasty. That's exactly what we want there too. So I open the refrigerator part and expect to be hit in the face with some pretty arid heat but it was cold. Was it broken? Oh, it has to be. There's no way that this warmer could be this cold. Something obviously isn't right. Then I also checked the freezer portion, which should have been even hotter, but it was actually colder. That wasn't right. It was not normal for this warmer to be this cold. The fans were blowing warm air, but it just wasn't warming anything up. And all of a sudden, it was then that I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. I have never felt that way at the job previously or ever since. So I turned around and looked up to see what I can only describe as a, a black mist or smoke towards the top of the ceiling. At first, I thought that maybe some part of the warmer's electric had fizzled out and this was the beginning of a fire. The problem was, the black mist or smoke was on the ceiling and in the opposite corner of the room. I looked at the warmer's connections and everything was as it was supposed to be. There was nothing wrong with the warmer, it seemed. But there was something in that OR sweet cubby that was not friendly and... It seemed rather malevolent. I knew then and there that this wasn't what the other girls described. This wasn't Sister Mary Margaret. She would never do anything menacing like this. Well, at least not based on the stories that I had heard. I can't explain how, but I knew not only that it wasn't her, but I also knew that she wasn't there to help protect me from whatever the heck this was. I watched as it slowly began to seep down from the corner of the ceiling towards myself and the warmer. I did what seemed to be the most sensible thing and I just began reciting the Lord's Prayer. And it paused, full stop. As I continued, it literally looked like a film being played in reverse. It slinked back to the corner that it came from and as soon as it did, it was just gone. Like 
it just disappeared before my eyes. I turned to hustle out of that little cubby area and back into the hallway. I happened to notice when I turned around to face the warmer that it was back to its normally toasty temperature as well. I didn't ruminate on it too long. I just booked it out of the OR suite to the hallway and I went back to the nurse's station. Now, I, until this very story, never said a thing to anyone about anything like this. I didn't mention my experience to co-workers, friends, or family. I honestly just didn't want to be ridiculed. But I just feel that this story, I'm no longer compelled to keep it to myself. There's really no harm in sharing it now, and I just really feel like getting it off my chest because the whole thing, I just feel really scared. When I was a kid, no older than 10, I was walking to the mailbox to get the mail from my parents' place and I was fully clad in my baseball uniform, ready to go, when a car pulled over and an elderly woman urged me to get into the car. Immediately, I obviously knew that something was off, but they said, come on, we're going to be late. She insisted. She went on saying things like my bat and glove were in the trunk, telling me that my dad had given it to them. She said that my dad couldn't take me anymore, so he asked them to take me and that they lived nearby. I honestly don't really remember what I did. I just remember the anxiety of piecing together what was happening. I want to say that I booked it and ran for the house, but as I've gotten older, I don't even remember anymore. All I remember is being back at my house and a creepy old lady ended up ringing the doorbell. When my dad answered, he was obviously confused and she told him that they were testing me to see if I would jump into the car. The most unsettling thing to me is that I don't remember if I actually got in their car. I'm not particularly old, but the experience pumped so much adrenaline in me that I just really don't remember it well. When I try to remember, I can picture both outcomes of me running home and me in their car. I just don't remember getting a scolding, so I tend to assume the former occurred, but I'm still not sure. Testing children or not, it was a messed up thing to do in your free time. It makes me wonder if this couple actually had the intentions that they spoke of. I remember getting home and not saying a word to my parents. The shock was still fresh and I had no time to process what had just happened. Was ringing the doorbell afterwards some kind of cover-up for a failed attempt to avoid being reported to the police? I still don't know, but I'm wondering if anybody else has ever encountered something similar. I just find the whole situation extremely off-putting. I mean, you don't really find too many kids walking around alone in a baseball uniform and coming up with that sort of stuff on the fly. It just gives me the impression that it was not that lady's first time trying to coax a kid into her car. So my family and I live in Mississippi and my husband and I are truck drivers and he's just accepted a job where he's getting trained in Atlanta, GA. And we just drove out there today. I dropped him off and then I drove six and a half hours back home. I don't get home till 1.30 in the morning and I've got to work tomorrow or later today. So I'm in the bath when I see my husband, clear as day, out of the corner of my eye, standing at the door in his underwear smirking at me, like he's had a bad joke that he can't wait to tell me. Now, normally I'm pretty jumpy and he likes to scare me, but this was definitely not normal. I mean, you normally hear my family being visited by dead relatives, but my husband is alive and well. In any case, I turned around and... When I did, there was nobody there. I called him about the encounter and he made jokes about it. But could this be something evil trying to mess with me? The thing or whatever it was disappeared when I got scared and jumped out of my skin. I shared this because I was really tired and when I get tired I get a bit paranoid. I had been running on 20 plus hours since I last slept and I haven't exactly been sleeping well for the last week. I have a son that is less than a year old too who still gets scared and when he wakes up I'm really just not there so he'll cry out and I'll have to wake up and put him back to sleep. 
I know it probably all seems a bit silly. I mean, chances are is that I was just tired and I mistook the shower curtain for my husband or something. But, I don't know, it seemed so clear at the time. Like, there was actually somebody there and when I rethink about it, it just really doesn't add up as to me just hallucinating or something. Plus, this has never really happened to me before, so maybe I'm just going mad right now or something, but I suspect not. In any case, thanks for listening, and if it happens again, I'll be sure to let you guys know. He is hoping, though, that it doesn't. I was with two of my friends that night when it happened. I was driving them home because I was the only one who didn't drink at the party that we attended earlier in the evening. We were on the road when my friend Alex felt sick so I decided to park the car a few minutes on the side road and wait for him to get better. I remember it though, it was a clear night because of the full moon high in the sky and the landscape was beautiful. The beach was close to the road and I could perfectly see it. To the dark grey sand, the bright sea and the big boulder in the middle, it was not far from the shore. But something strange was on it so I got a bit closer. At first I was startled because who in their right mind could sleep on a boulder half immersed in the cold water of winter at three in the morning. But that was where things got weird. The thing looked like a woman at first but instead of legs it seemed to have a, a strong tail covered in scales with what looked like a, a shark fin on top of her back. Her skin seemed grey but with the night the way that it was it was hard to tell because everything else around me was pretty grey as well. She seemed to sleep though with her head resting on her forearms. In panic I shouted to my friend Myra to put the headlight of the car on because I wanted to see it better and when I looked in front of me again there was this thing. I will never forget it as long as I live too. She was staring at me, her bottom half lying on the boulder while she was standing on her webbed hands which seemed to end with sort of claws. Her hair was moving with the wind but it was weird, almost like snakes but it wasn't really snakes. It's hard to describe that bit. She had two large white eyes with no pupils at all or eyebrows and instead of a nose she sort of had six slits on both sides of her face and her mouth was extremely small, thin, with no lips. I was frightened by her eyes, staring at me. I couldn't move a single muscle in my body. I just stood there, frozen. Then I hear my friends run to me and before they arrived, she turned on her tail and disappeared into the sea with a loud splash and waves all around. And just like that, she was gone. All of this happened in seconds, mind you, but man, it felt so much longer than that. My friends, they didn't see anything and I was too shocked to tell them. Plus, I knew that they probably wouldn't believe me anyway. To this day, they still don't know what happened to me and I never really told anybody either. I mean, again, nobody would have believed me anyway and to be honest, I really wouldn't blame them. If this would have happened to anybody else, I never would have believed them either. And frankly, uh, I didn't want to be called crazy. Sometimes I wonder if I wasn't crazy, but... Then one day, several months after that night, I saw on TV that a diver was apparently scared to death at the same area. Doctors said that he must have seen something really scary. I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but it definitely freaked me out. I still don't know if she was good or not. I was just too scared. All I know is that I was just terrified. Humans are scared of the unknown, I guess, and this definitely proved to be true. Since then, I've been scared to swim. I live on an island, so of course there is the sea all around, but I just really don't go there. I'm still too scared, and I don't ever want to see anything like that ever again. I never return to that beach because, well, I know what's out there. So my dad and I flip houses for a living. We do everything, so house renovations can take anywhere from a couple of months to a year and up. 
But this is what happened to us in a 100 plus year old farmhouse in northwest New Jersey, USA, about three years ago. This old farmhouse was beautiful but extremely run down. It had sat vacant prior to our purchasing it for at least 15 years. Also, there was evidence that squatters had been there at one point. The house had good bones, as they say, so it wasn't worth it to tear it down and start from scratch. The first part of our job is the cleanup and demo. I've noticed that every house has its own vibe and energy. However, this old farmhouse was a bit different. It was four floors, including basement and attic. Anytime you were downstairs on the main floor, kitchen, living room and office, it felt fine, normal even. But when you went upstairs, it was different. There was just a, a heaviness up there. I would announce every time that I came in the house, hey, it's just me, is it cool if I come up to do such and such? I also would announce myself any time that I would come into the house downstairs with a, hey, how are you doing today? My dad would look at me like I was crazy because I never did this anywhere else, ever. And to be honest, I don't know why I did it here. I just sort of felt the need to, I guess. Like a, a deep itch in my brain, pleading me to say it. So I just did, each and every time. Now, within the first few days of the clean-out and demo, my dad found something disturbing. In the master bedroom upstairs, there was a small closet with a light in it. Hanging on the inside of the closet door on a coat hook was a bloody dog collar. But there were weird symbols spray-painted only in the closet as well. Something looked like it had been burned in a pile on the floor in the closet... I refused to touch it and got extremely upset at the sight of the dog collar. Furious even. I mean, who would do something to a poor animal like this? I was so bothered that my dad told me to go home for the day and I did. It just makes me sick thinking about the, the sick people who would do whatever to have something like that there and my dad and other co-workers cleaned it out. Also, the light in that closet, we never got to work. We do minor electrical repairs all the time and we just could not figure it out. Had a master electrician come and they couldn't get it to work either. New light fixture, new wiring, new everything and nothing just ever seemed to work. In any case, when we had finished cleaning out the living quarters, we decided to work on the attic in the basement. The basement was okay. Honestly, the bottom half of the house, basement and second floor, kitchen, office and living room felt fine, neutral even. But the attic, the attic was terrible. I could not bring myself to go up there, not even once. Not to be that guy as well, but I worked on the other floors of the house and my dad understood without me even having to explain, which honestly speaks volumes because he is real skeptical. Now one day, I had to hold the flashlight for my dad while he was in the attic. I stood on the stairs with only my head and upper torso sticking into the attic space. The lights never would work up there either, but this attic had one of those pull-down from the ceiling foldable ladders. It was located in the hallway between the master bedroom, second bedroom, and only bathroom. And the second that we opened it, this rank smell hit us hard in the face. Death. For sure, something must have died up there, we thought. There were those large black flies that seemed to swarm to rot and death everywhere as well. To say that it was an infestation of flies is honestly an understatement. I stood on the ladder, almost falling multiple times from furiously swatting these demon bugs away. My dad looked everywhere for the cause of the flies, for days even, and he just never found anything. Before we sold the house, we finally got the flies to go away. This was after months of trying, by the way. However, when the new owner chose to rent the house out, the flies apparently kept coming back. And to this day, almost three years later, exterminators, pest control guys have been called out multiple times, and the flies always still seem to come back. The master bedroom, too, had something else happen after the closet was cleaned up. I talked my dad into burying the dog collar, by the way, but there were four windows in the master, two windows on the north wall and two on the west. The north wall windows, one suddenly just had two bats on them, and 
They were somehow wedged between the glass and the screen of this old window. We needed to replace all the windows anyway, so we tried everything to free the bats without hurting them. We worked during the day, so bats being nocturnal, we figured that it explained why they never moved during the day. But when we would come the next day, they seemed to have moved overnight, so we knew that they were alive. But these poor bats had me seriously fretting. Any dead bugs I found during the cleanup, I would put into this windowsill, hoping that they would eat them. I know that that's weird, but I don't know. I'm a, a diehard animal lover, I guess. But it appeared that they were stuck, and it was killing me to see them like that. But it also made no logical sense how they got in there either. Also, it was early summer, so they weren't hibernating either. In the end, my dad and I decided to get a ladder and try from the outside of the house. He finally got it so that the bats could undoubtedly get out if they wanted. But the bats? They never moved from that window screen for weeks. And then, one day, they were just gone. I thought for a long time that my dad had discovered that they were dead and disposed of them as to not upset me. But he promises me that he didn't do that. And that after weeks of them moving barely inches, they had indeed left of their own volition. We eventually finished the house and sold it. The new owner rented it out to tenants. Tenants would move in, stay for a month or two, then break their leases and move out. This apparently happened four times since we finished. And after each move out, we were contracted to come and do a fresh coat of paint, deep clean, patch up a hole, or any other fixes needed. And the feeling of that house, it just never changed. Also, I want to add too that we told the new owner about all the weirdness prior to them purchasing. But my dad is a skeptical guy and he really has no explanation for any of this stuff either. My dad also announces himself anytime that he goes into the house now. We met every tenant that lived there at some point in their rental life and they all seem like normal people and not the type to just break their leases for no reason. I don't know. I feel like the house needs a cleansing or something. But to whoever did that poor thing to that dog and made the house dirty like that, whoever you are, I hope that you reap what you sow. This happened a, a few years ago, around mid-November. My mother and I loved being outside and going for walks. This night in particular was freezing, but we decided that we wanted to go out for a quick walk anyway. As we walked back home, we went down this one street that we used all the time. It's a neighborhood street that leads to the main street, then back to our neighborhood. We get about halfway down the street when I hear a dog bark over the music on my phone. I turn it off and turn to look for the dog because, well, I love dogs and I wasn't aware that there was a big one on the street. The context to, I know quite a few people on this street and I know which houses have dogs. Most of the people on the block have small dogs or cats. This came from a house that didn't seem to have a dog, let alone a big dog. In any case, I spun around and what I saw was a big dark mass just feet from me. If he stepped two more feet, he would have been able to grab me. I immediately felt weird and started speed walking back to my mum, who at that point didn't realize that I'd stopped. I turned off my phone and whispered to her that I thought that we were being followed. She turned around, grabbed my arm, and told me that there were two men right behind us. We started walking in a zigzag pattern and sure enough, they followed our every step. Once they caught on that we knew, one of the dudes started to make small chit-chat with us. Awfully late for you to be walking, huh? I swear his voice sounded like the definition of siren sounds, luring sailors to their doom. He continued asking questions to us though. My mum kept walking and replying with quick replies. From the sound of his voice, I knew that we were in danger, so I went to dial 911. But instead, my mum told me to call my dad as he would be able to get to us much quicker because we were almost home now. We got to the busy street and looked behind us to see them speed walking to us. We decided to risk it and ran to the middle of the street as cars passed on either side of us. We ran across again and met my dad on that side. We looked, 
we looked back across the street and now both men were gone. We got into the car and searched the streets, but these guys disappeared into, honestly, what seemed like thin air. I asked my mum if we would have been kidnapped if I hadn't have heard that dog, and she asked what dog. I asked her how she didn't hear this massive dog bark, especially with how good her hearing is, and I still have no clue what it was that I heard, but I know that whatever it was, it most likely saved my life. I wanted to share a story that honestly is quite chilling, with the permission from my grandpa of course. I'll admit that I'm still a bit skeptical about this story, but the more that I thought about it, the more horrifying it is. So, for a bit of background, I'm half Filipino and half American. Every summer my parents and I would visit the Philippines and usually stay at my grandparents' place. A week ago, my grandpa on my mum's side told me this true story from his youth. And the way that he said it, I noticed that he was still shaken and scared from, well, whatever happened. Back in 1970, when my grandpa was 18, he was dating this girl who was a year younger than him for over a year. Her name was S. S was beautiful, sweet, kind, and easy on the eyes, according to him anyway. When summer started, S invited him to her parents' home in the province. S was currently staying with her aunt while she went to school in my grandpa's town. My grandpa was skeptical at first because the area that S lived in was quite rural and would take five hours to arrive by bus. But grandpa was infatuated with S, so he said, eh, why not? So, with the permission from his parents, he packed up and he and S were on their way. When they arrived at her hometown, he noticed that a lot of people were staring at them. It was a small town, so the population wasn't that big. S showed him around, where the shops were, the diners, etc. But Grandpa would notice people staring at them a lot. At one time, he heard a couple whisper, a swung. Now, in Filipino folklore, an aswang is a malevolent, shape-shifting, flesh-eating monster. From what I learned, by the day they look and act like normal people. However, at night, they reveal their true selves. Anyway, S and Grandpa arrived at S's house. It was a large three-story wooden home. Grandpa then met S's parents. They greeted him warmly and invited him in and exchanged talks over dinner. Grandpa said that they seemed like a couple of nice normal people, but on the first night, he was sleeping in S's room on the second floor and Grandpa woke up hearing what he described as a, a strange noise. The first thing that he noticed was that S was gone. He assumed that she must have went to the bathroom or something like that, so he lied down again. But the weird sound continued. It was coming from the floor above him, and he said that it sounded like a, a cat scratching its claws on the wooden floor, accompanied by what sounded like a person mumbling. He tried to ignore it, but it started getting louder until he could hear multiple clawing noises from above, like multiple cats scratching on wooden floors as well as mumbling. S still hasn't come back at this point, which made him worry, but that was when he heard loud thumping from upstairs, like a person jumping. Grandpa is really weirded out at this point, obviously, so he covers his ears with his pillow. The next day, he told S that their cats were really loud and that he couldn't sleep. S just looked at him confused and said, We don't have cats. Huh, that's weird, he says. I could have sworn that I heard cats last night. On the second night, he was woken up again by the same sounds. He says at that point he was thinking, What is this? And then he hears loud grunting from above like an animal in pain. He tries going back to sleep, but then he's startled by what sounded like a roar. This continues for another day, until on the fourth night, Grandpa decided that he had had enough. He was going to man up, march upstairs, and see what the heck was going on. So, it was around one in the morning, according to him. 
He said that it was strange because he didn't hear any more of the weird sounds, but he decided to go upstairs anyway. He tiptoed across the floor and reached the stairs leading to the third floor. Once he reached the third floor, he notices something weird. The lights wouldn't work, even though they were working fine before he went to bed. The only source of light was the moonlight which illuminated the interior. He makes his way to the room that was above him on the second floor, where the sounds were coming from. And what he saw made the hairs on the back of his neck instantly stand up. The floor was littered with claw marks. The windows were wide open and there were bloodstains all across the floor. There were also no signs of S or her parents anywhere. Freaked out, he went back down to the second floor, but then his nose caught a whiff of something that he hadn't noticed before. It was coming from what seemed to be the kitchen. Curious now, he went to take a look, but it was so dark that he could barely make anything out anyway. As he walked, his hand touched something that felt like a, a large metal pot. He opened the lid, and a great number of flies escaped, and his nose was assaulted by an extremely awful and putrid smell that he said nearly made him vomit. It was so dark that he couldn't see what was inside the pot, so he immediately slammed down the lid and ran back to the room and forced himself to sleep. The next day, during lunch, S's mother served him animal blood that's been cooked and mixed with herbs and spices. But my grandpa excused himself and lied that he was feeling sick. He didn't want to know what was in the food. S's mother tried to coax him into eating it, saying that he'll regain his energy from this. And this is when grandpa takes the opportunity to try to find out the truth. You see... In the folklore, to identify whether or not a person is an Aswang is quite simple. Observe their eyes, and if your reflection is upside down, then they're an Aswang. Grandpa stared at S's mum's eyes, and he reeled back in horror, because he saw his reflection was upside down. This is when the mum's expression completely changed. She went from concerned to what seemed to be angry, and was glaring hard at Grandpa, an expression that basically said, according to him, you shouldn't have done that. That night, Grandpa doesn't waste any time, immediately packs up, and he heads home. He lied that there had been a family emergency in order to get out of there, but he finally returns home and spent a lot of time inside of his house in complete fear. The following month, he breaks up with S and she looked at him in sadness and said that apparently she understands that it was a wise choice for him, but it was quite a shame. Grandpa ended the story and he said that it really was a huge shame because he really wanted to marry S. But what do you guys all think? What are your thoughts and opinions about this story? Like I said, I'm still a bit skeptical about the whole thing, obviously, but yeah, if you would like to share your opinions, then I would appreciate that. This story happened to my mother and younger sister, who I'll refer to as S in this post. It happened in Brooklyn, New York in the late 90s. I was in the second or third grade, and S was around four years old. So, we had a back porch overlooking a small fenced yard and lawn. We get the occasional regular-sized praying mantis, according to S. One day, though, she was playing in the yard while my mum was hanging laundry up on the back porch. Apparently, this thing just suddenly materialized right in the middle of the yard, this is because S says that she turned around and there it was. She said that she just stared at it for a few moments, not sure if it was a toy or not. She said that it looked like a, a two and a half to three foot long praying mantis with big red eyes and tiny black pinpricks for pupils. When the fear finally hit her, S ran up the stairs shouting for mum. All she could express at the time was that it was a big bug. My mom barely reacted, of course, because kids get scared by normal bugs all the time. But this thing actually followed S up the stairs. 
For so long I've imagined what they must have looked like. But S convinced my mum to go inside with her. And that's when my mum finally saw it. While she and S were watching it from inside through the mesh door, the praying mantis perched itself on one of the chairs on the porch. Not like on the top of the back cushion or on the armrest or something, but just in the chair proper, like sitting there. When my mum went looking for a camera, all at once it just disappeared. I asked if it flew away, but neither of them had any answer. They just said that it was gone as instantly as it showed up. When my dad brought me home from school, maybe around a half an hour to an hour later, they were still hiding behind the mesh door looking terrified. I never got told the full version of this story till S was a bit older, but for years she would become hysterical if she ever saw a praying mantis or even the image of one. I wondered about what this thing could have been or why it only showed itself to mum and S. I do know, however, that as I got older I found out that my mother was a very abusive woman and S and I believed suffer the most because of it. It makes me wonder if one of the people that I've told this story to is right about it being a demon or maybe something else, or perhaps at least a bad omen. Whatever it was, it's a weird story, I acknowledge that, and it's something that has just always stuck within our family. When I was about 10 years old, my mum had her second kid. We didn't have a ton of money, so it wasn't uncommon for our cars to break down or need to be repaired. And well, one day my mum, my baby sister and I were heading to my aunt's house. She lived kind of up in the mountains, so to get there we had to take a, a pretty steep inclined highway. Then it sort of veered off into the more rural area where my aunt lived. Maybe about halfway up the incline, my mum's car started to sputter. We could feel the car giving out and... I remember my mum just trying to get the car as close to the exit as possible. And well, the car unfortunately didn't make it, and we broke down on the side of the highway. This was before cell phones were popular, so the only way to get help was to walk to the nearest payphone. We were probably about maybe half a mile or so from the exit, and right off that exit was a gas station. My mum told me to get as close to the guardrail as possible, and we began walking. Within a few moments, a man pulled up beside us and asked if we needed a ride. My mum cradled my sister, shoved me to the side and quickly said no to the man. She did that hip bump thing that people do and at first I was like, what the heck? Because if I would have fallen over the rail, I would have tumbled down a pretty steep hill. But then I looked over and very clearly saw a gun on the man's front seat. It was half covered with a handkerchief but... It was clearly a small handgun. He pulled it closer to him and tried to fully conceal it, but both I and my mum had already seen it. He drove slowly beside us trying to convince my mum to get into the car with him, but my mum just kept saying no. She wasn't rude or mean about it, calm as a clam, just friendly as she could be. He finally pulled off as we got closer to the exit though. I'm guessing that he wanted to stay on the highway. Once he pulled off, my mum looked at me and said, he was going to kill us. And the way that she said it was eerily calm. When I was in high school a few years ago, I was asleep in bed on a weekend. I woke up at like two in the morning because I heard yelling outside. My dad works the graveyard shift for context, but he usually gets home at like 5 or 6 in the morning. I thought that it was really weird, but I hurried downstairs in any case, because it sounded just like him. He was yelling my name, telling me to let him in and to help him. I woke up my mum as well. She was obviously less than thrilled to be up, although she heard it too because she then said, What the? Why is he yelling like that? As we both headed to the side door to let him in, he just wasn't there. His car wasn't there either. In fact, nobody was. And as soon as I opened the door, the yelling stopped too. My mum and I just stared at each other for a good few minutes, unsure what we'd heard, because it was so weird. 
I even asked her again if she really heard it too, and she confirmed it. The thing that made me bring this up, though, was something that happened yesterday. You see, I'm in college now, on summer vacation. At this time, I was drawing in my bedroom, and I should mention, too, that right now my mother is visiting family on the other side of the country, so I'm home alone at this time. It was around 10.40 when I heard the exact same thing, except it was now my mum's voice, except she was just yelling my name outside. It lasted like a minute, but I didn't answer the door like last time. And all I can say is that it was really strange. And I figured that I should share it here because it was so recent. And see if anyone knows what I should do about, well, whatever this is. When I was a little girl, my family lived in a small house. I was about four years old, living with my sister, mum, and dad, and it wasn't uncommon for other brothers and sisters or cousins, etc., to be around and witness things too. Now, my memory from the time in this house is a bit vague as I was so little, but the paranormal events are still easy to remember. I was a, a normal girl too until we moved into this house. Well, I guess I was normal. But once we did, my behavior became increasingly erratic and disturbed. Behaviors included things like running full force into closed windows and putting my head through the glass, trying to run onto a road in front of a car, drawing my house on fire, drawing myself stabbing my dad. But this, this isn't where it ends. You see, the hauntings in the house took place in my bedroom that I shared with my older sister by 10 years and mainly seemed to take place in that room. For the most part, nothing too strange occurred daily besides an eerie feeling, I guess. But when events did occur, they were definitely major. Like once, while walking down a hallway, my toy castle flew out of the room hard enough to crack the hallway wall. We were all going to bed after a party and we had guests staying that night. And as we walked down the hallway, the castle just flew hard enough into the wall to do that. We all were very unnerved and freaked out, obviously, going to bed shortly after that. Then a strange event when my sister would open the window and as soon as she was near it, it would slam shut. She got hurt a few times because of this too. My behavior in the house was getting worse as well as this was all going on and I apparently became obsessed with playing in my bedroom closet. I'd go into the closet with my toys, but my memories of what took place after that are completely blank. The closet was small but contained a small step up ledge. There was a bar to hang hangers on and that was about it. Apparently I would play in the closet every day until one day my dad made the decision to seal the closet shut. You see, one night, my sister was sleeping. She woke up screaming, saying that she saw a little girl in a dress hanging in the closet. It was then that my mom and dad ran into the room comforting us. The next day, my dad began sealing the closet shut so that I couldn't get in and the door couldn't open. Years later, I found out that the reason that he did this is that the same night my sister saw the girl, my dad had a dream about the exact same girl hanging in the closet. It didn't take long after these events that we moved, but other notable events that took place are shadows under the doors, crying from a closet under the basement stairs, a strange song that would always play all over the house, me getting pushed down the basement stairs, seeing something and then blacking out. And it was after this that we moved. But years later, while looking at childhood memories, my mum showed me kindergarten homework. And this is where I discovered my toddler drawings of my house being on fire and me harming my dad. But it gets worse. You see, one of the papers asked me my favorite hobby, and me as a four-year-old wrote, play with the girl in my closet. That toddler reformative time in my life feels like it was a dream. I have almost no memories besides the paranormal events really, and even some of those I think I'm missing. However, even after leaving that house, disturbing things would happen with me. 
Even in other homes, I'd get this nagging thought in my mind. Go into the closet, close the door, put a hanger around your neck. Lights would flicker, and there'd be strange sounds, but the worst is definitely waking up and seeing a girl next to me. For the longest time too, I choked waking up, and I would see this girl within night terrors. But I could move and scream and run even. But otherwise, it was very traditional in terms of being like sleep paralysis. I wake up every once in a while to the same girl sitting near me. She has hair covering her face, and it's always very dark. Once I woke up and she was sitting in my chair, once she was hanging from the ceiling, then standing in a TV reflection... I always saw a shadowy figure standing just outside of my vision as well, which was always a bit strange to me. Ever since we left that house, though, I have had this disturbing feeling and connection to the events there. My memory is nothing but amnesia. After that house, I experienced awful deja vu as well. I really don't know how to explain it, but it's almost as if the girl and I somehow became connected or she inhabits me somehow. I started researching last year to try and find any phenomena that could explain this. Two souls in one body, a, a ghost kicking with the living person's soul out and taking over, anything. And I think the far more likely explanation is that she followed me and has all of this time. I can't help but wonder if the happy little girl that I remembered from my childhood, me, didn't meet an awful fate at some point. Sometimes I just don't recognize myself anymore and I was never the same after that house. I'm mentally sound beyond depression by the way so I would love an explanation for what the heck has been haunting me my whole life. So I would like to start by saying that I grew up in Mexico, in a small tiny town where everybody knows everyone. My family wasn't very wealthy by any means, but we were one of the more well-known families as my family was huge. I mention this too to show that my hometown was pretty safe, especially for me at the time. Now, I grew up in the late 90s, early 2000s, and even though I didn't get a, a lot of the things that kids in the US got, I did live in the go home with the street lights on sort of era, and unfortunately my parents weren't around for most of my childhood, a lot of the time anyway. They weren't divorced or anything, but they just weren't very great together. But I got used to going home at all hours of the night is what I'm getting at. Sometimes I wouldn't even go home instead of spending the night at a friend's or cousin's house. But one night, during summer break, I decided to stay late at a cousin's house watching movies and just generally playing around. Time went by and it became pretty late. I didn't want to stay that night because of some private drama that had been going on between my aunt and uncle. So I decided to go home instead. It was well past midnight at this point when I left. The night was cloudy but bright with a full moon. Not many stars could be seen and the clouds covered the moonlight a lot. The walk home wasn't very far, just around the block which was almost three quarters of a mile or so. It also didn't bother me much because all the houses lining both sides of the street were family members, almost anyway, all the way home. But my block was always the darkest in the neighborhood though. It had four light posts but only two ever actually worked one by my house and the other at the corner house next to mine. Of course, my cousin's house was in the direction of the dark side of the street. A few neighbors did have front door lights, but they honestly didn't help much. The corner house was always going in and out anyway, but that meant that sometimes people lived there and sometimes it was abandoned. And many people thought that it was the cartels coming and going, which it probably was, but that's a story for another time. The next house to that, though, was owned by an old lady, a retired nurse that lived there my entire life, and who knows how much longer after I moved. But the house next to hers is the reason that I'm telling this story. You see, it had been abandoned my whole life. Overgrown grass, broken windows, doors, doors falling off hinges, and everything that you would picture an old creepy house to be like. There was even a very big overgrown bushy mesquite tree, I'm not sure how tall, but I would say at least 30 feet. That tree, 
always made it even more dark for a good stretch of the street. It blocked off even more moonlight and as I approached that house, every night I walked by, I would usually go around the block taking the long way home or squeeze myself against the opposite side of the street. This night though, I decided to just push through as I was getting increasingly tired pretty quickly. I hyped myself up like every kid did when doing things that scared them a bit. I started walking fast, but when I got to the house, I then heard somebody calling me. Not by name, but just someone saying, hey kid, and come over here, want to play games? Now, my hometown did have homeless people and all that, but... They mostly kept to the project homes that the state governor started funding, but my hometown was never really finished. My mind automatically went to, that's not human for some reason, and my body just froze. I couldn't move, and I felt like I couldn't breathe. I have no idea how long I stayed standing like that, but man, it felt like a long time. I tried to turn and look at what was calling me. The whole time it hadn't stopped, mind you. Whatever it was, it didn't seem to come closer or be making any attempt to come closer, in fact. I finally fully looked at it and I felt my heart jump to my throat. What I saw was a kid standing next to the abandoned house. He was fully visible and illuminated, which at first didn't register in my mind, but how could I see him perfectly fine, even though while standing under the shadow of the tree like that? My heart now felt like it was about to leap out of my chest. It was beating so fast that I thought it was about to explode. I managed to make eye contact at one point with this kid and all of a sudden it began calling me by my actual name. By now, it had started actually walking towards me. It seemed to take one step every few words and it then went completely black for a few seconds and emerged again into the light, but this time... It looked exactly like me, even wearing what I had on at the time. Now, I don't know what took hold of me, but I managed to break out of whatever spell or whatever I was in and began running for my life. As soon as I ran, though, I stopped hearing it call my name. It felt like a lot of weight was lifted off of my chest and shoulders, too, which was weird. But being just a few houses away from mine, it wasn't a long run, thankfully. Although, it felt a lot longer than normal, that's for sure. Now, to this day, I don't know what that was, and I never did see anything like that again. I told a few friends about it years later, and they thought that it was all some kind of demon. I have absolutely no idea what it was, if I'm being honest, or what it wanted. I have long since moved away from my hometown in Mexico entirely, but I still have many stories from back then. But for now, this one will have to do. Thanks for listening. So, my story begins roughly a year and some change after the field incident. We'd chosen this particular duplex because it was cheap, 650 a month, and it had the space that we needed. Like a lot of structures of this sort, it could have passed for a normal house as it had two levels that we had full access to. The house itself was built around 1911 and was showing its age in some ways but was otherwise fairly suitable. Minus the roach infestation that we had going on thanks to our neighbours, which as we would find out after they moved out in the middle of the night, was caused by neglecting the children and a general lack of ever ever cleaning. The smell coming out of that house was palpable even from a distance. We were barely into our first night in our new home when it became obvious that something was off. First came the face peeking into one of the upstairs windows as I was unpacking by myself. To this day, I'm genuinely surprised that I didn't leave a trail of pee behind me after my brain processed that I was being watched by a man who most certainly should have been where he was, either alive or dead. I quickly ran and told my ex's father who had come up from Alabama to help us with the move and naturally by the time that he got to the room the face was gone and left me looking stupid. But this would go on to become a, a reoccurring theme during our first few months on the property. At first he said that I must have seen my own reflection but A. I didn't scare easily and B. I know what my face looks like and it certainly wasn't mine. 
The other theory was that it must have been the teenage boy who lived in the other half who climbed onto the roof of the lower add-on, hoping to see some girl on girl action or something. The only issue was that the entire family was black, I'm Mexican, and the face that I saw was pale and vaguely see-through. So, unless the peeper was also wearing a full face of makeup and hoop earrings, I don't know, it just doesn't make any sense. The next few days of settling in were fairly uneventful though. It wasn't until a week later when we were watching a show in our upstairs bedroom that we noticed our two cats were sitting on the landing looking down at something intently. Of course, we dismissed it as weird cat behavior until we heard a very audible, very distinct feminine voice go meow meow from the bottom of the steps. It was almost as though whoever or whatever was trying to get their attention. Of course, we both immediately froze. I mean, it was just us in the house at that point. Well, it should have been. And while it was certainly creepy, we took it as a good sign that the cats weren't hissing or poofing up at this entity and we just kind of wrote it off as weird and possibly a, a shared overactive imagination. And it wasn't until my ex had to use the bathroom, which was unfortunately downstairs, that things sort of escalated into, well, downright scary. Once she came back to bed, she told me that as she was coming back, she saw a male face peering in our middle room window. The only issue was that this window was eight feet off the ground and also had a large AC unit in it that would have prevented anyone from pressing their face against the glass panes like that. After that night, weird yet random things would happen such as unexplainable thumps and a horrible sense of foreboding in both the kitchen and the back room where I first saw the face. This feeling of dread only really happened at night with it being the most intense in the kitchen if one went for a late night snack. I often joked that the spirit was judging us for eating so late, but as I found out later, a previous female tenant had apparently died suddenly in there. And once I knew that, it all sort of made a bit more sense. Eventually, we contacted two separate paranormal investigation groups. The first ones who came through didn't experience anything, earth shattering at least, Nothing enough to do anything about, and despite having the entities directly answer my questions through a spirit box or whatever they're called, concluded that it was more than likely just our imaginations. The second group wasn't much different, coming to the conclusion that my service related to PTSD was making me paranoid. Mind you, this was after we all witnessed one of those screw-top flashlights being turned on and off by itself whenever the one of the investigators asked it to, along with a few floating entities being caught on a Kinect camera and being fairly interactive with all of them. It wasn't though until our neighbors abandoned their side of the duplex in the middle of the night that it all began to make a lot more sense. Once the owners began doing a deep clean and tossing out everything, I noticed a Ouija board sticking out of one of the trash bags that they'd left on the front porch. And, unsurprisingly, once the board had been removed from the property, activity slowed down considerably, save for some random pounding on their side of the wall at all hours of the night, and the silhouette of a man staring down at you from their upstairs window. That and cabinet doors in our kitchen randomly flying open, which got really annoying after a while. However, these occurrences were all fairly rare for the next two years. That was until we broke up and I was left alone with the cats to use as explanations for weird noises. At which point, it all became more terrifying than it had ever been. Hoof steps and banging on the roof were common. A very heavy and sickening presence throughout the entire house was the most disturbing. More thumping on the walls... A friend who stayed over one night reported to see a figure hovering in one of the corners of the living room, his eyes glowing as he looked down at us. And after enduring all of this for nearly two months, I was incredibly thankful to leave when I'd found another place to rent. I must say though, I feel pretty bad for whoever lives there next. This is a story that happened to me a few years ago when I was 26. I've been too scared to talk about it until now out of fear of 
being made fun of, but here is my story. My name is Sarah. So four years ago, my great-grandmother passed away at the age of 98. We were close all the way into my adult years, so the death hit me hard. She lived in a one-story house in a rural town 30 minutes outside of Springfield, Missouri. Her house sat on a large and heavily forested piece of land. There was a large hill several hundred feet behind the house that dropped off into a creek and I spent almost my entire childhood staying on this piece of land and had learned how to take care of it and the house. After the funeral services I volunteered to stay and take care of the land while my family decided on what to do with it. Unfortunately I wasn't able to buy the land so I wanted to spend as much time out there as I could. My first three days I spent packing up items and cleaning the house just generally. The nearest neighbor was like five miles away so I didn't have to worry about unwanted guests that would get into the way of my packing and disturb my personal way of mourning the loss of someone so close to me. But the fourth day is when the odd events started occurring. I slept in a sleeping bag in the living room and when I woke up I immediately screamed because a few inches away from my face was a dead copperhead snake. It was normal for snakes and other small animals to get into the house so seeing the snake wasn't surprising but it was the fact that it was so close to my face and it could have bitten me at any moment while I was sleeping. I briefly wondered why the snake had just come into the house and died like that because there were no physical signs that anything was wrong with it. So I just threw it outside and continued with my day and the weird event was almost forgotten. Later that evening though I decided to go for a walk through the woods to enjoy the nice weather and reminisce about the good times that I had in the woods and all the games that I used to play there. I was walking along an old path that led to a well. The path was narrow and was close to the drop off that led to the creek. When I heard a branch snap behind me and instinctively turned my head. I didn't see anything so... I assumed it must have just been an animal and continued walking. But just a few minutes later I heard a snap to my left and turned to look again, but I still didn't see anything. I started to worry that I was being stalked by something, but it was rare to see large animals in this area, so I continued walking. At some point I heard a third snap directly in front of me, but now instead of being worried, I was upset. I was convinced that somebody else was out there trying to scare me so I shouted at what I assumed to be a person to go away and everything went just really uncomfortably silent for a moment but then I started to hear footsteps approaching in front of me but I couldn't see anything. They got faster and faster until whoever or whatever it was was running right at me. I covered my face with my arms instinctively and waited to be attacked by some invisible person, but the footsteps stopped. I slowly lowered my arms, but instead of seeing a person, a bobcat, or even a bear, I saw a huge spider in the middle of a web that I hadn't noticed before. If I would have even taken one more step, I probably would have ended up being bitten. I turned at that and I ran as fast as I could through the overgrowth and back to the house. I was spooked but I was out in the middle of the woods and sometimes things like this happened. I knew this land and the house well so I pushed through the night and the next two days nothing out of the ordinary happened. I started yard work by the second week staying out of the house and it wasn't bad. I'd actually found some old trinkets from my childhood that I'd buried under a tree in fact. While I was picking up fallen branches from a storm the previous night I noticed a clump of, like, hair was caught in one of them. I remember its color being brown and black and considered the possibility of it being a rare encounter with a bear, but there were no tracks that I could see. I brushed it off again, but I was starting to think that maybe someone else was staying on the property and that really upset me. I decided to stay up late to see if I could catch the person in the act. Nothing happened until around 2 a.m., I remember everything so vividly because of how terrified I was as well. And this is what happened. So, it started with branches crunching and the sound of a, a wheelbarrow that I'd been using earlier falling over. I readied my flashlight and a small knife just in case whoever it was got violent, I guess. 
I heard them step onto the front porch and pull at the screen door, but they quickly abandoned it and instead started walking around the house. I could hear them scraping something sharp against the house and I was furious over that. I stood up and shined my flashlight at the nearest window that I assumed the person was standing near and shouted at them, I have a weapon, get off this property now. Everything stopped for a moment and I was positive that whoever it was had left until I heard something slam against the window so hard I was surprised that it didn't break. My flashlight shined on the person and at first I wasn't sure what I was looking at. It had long dark hair with eyes that were way too big for its face. Its skin was wrinkled and reminded me of sort of like a naked mole rat. It pressed its face against the glass and fogged it up with its breath. I heard it run around the house several times and bang on every wall, window and the door every time it passed them. This went on for hours as well and I was just too scared to move or do anything. I was completely alone being tormented by some strange monster and every now and then I would get the courage to shine my flashlight and caught a glimpse of the thing. Each time I saw it, it also looked more and more animal-like. In the end, all I could really do was cry and just wait for it to go away. Finally, just after sunrise, the running and the banging stopped but I didn't dare move until well after 9 o'clock. It took all of my courage to open the front door and see what damage had been done to the house and the yard after the terrifying experience from the night before, but when I did, the strangest thing is that there was nothing. No footprints, no scratches against the house or broken cracked windows. It was almost like, I don't know, like I'd imagined the whole thing, but I knew what I saw and had experienced was real. Anyway, nothing else happened for the rest of my stay there and by the end of the month, my grandfather came to pick me up and take care of the belongings that I'd packed away. I was still terrified by what had happened but I'd almost convinced myself that I'd imagined it until my grandfather spoke to me. You see, he told me that he was happy that this land was being sold and how much he hated growing up here. When I asked him why... His answer seemed to validate my experience almost. Now, my grandfather is a very serious, no-nonsense sort of guy. He was the type of person that stayed quiet, but when he did speak, you'd better listen because it was important. He was a hardened war veteran and devoted Christian, so things like paranormal and supernatural were just sort of like fairy tales to him, I guess you could say. He made sure to tell his children and me and the rest of my siblings and even my cousins that too. He told me how his mother, my great-grandmother, would always try to scare me and his sisters with stories about the land being guarded by monsters. The story says that these monsters, hybrids is what he called them, were the children of falsely accused witches. The people living in the area back then, when this was going on, claimed that the children were part witch and part animal and needed to be killed, so they were left in the forest to die. He said that when the witch children died... They came back as spirits and claimed the woods as their own and any unwelcome visitors would be tortured until they were literally scared to death. Just how their falsely accused mothers would be scared when they had been killed too. My grandfather said that he didn't believe in much outside of religion but he believed that the hybrids were real and that he had been tormented by one when he tried to go hunting in the woods for the first time and shot his first deer. He believed that he had upset something by killing an innocent animal and never stepped foot on the land with a weapon and they finally left him alone. Now, maybe this is a foolish thing to believe in and who knows, maybe I did just imagine the whole thing, but I believe that the story my grandfather told me is true, simply because we both had very similar terrifying experiences. If I'd had a camera, I would have tried to take a picture of the creature or if I could draw, I would draw something, I guess. But I remember every detail about what I saw and it will be burned into my memory for as long as I live. I guess the saddest thing about all of this though is that all of my childhood memories seem tainted now because of this experience. And now I don't think I'm going to miss this land as much as I first thought. It didn't take long for the land and the house to be sold to. The hybrids or whatever is out there can be somebody else's nightmare for now I guess. 
because one night for me was more than enough. This happened to me and the man that I was dating back in the late spring of 2000. I'm an avid and experienced urban explorer. I visit many different abandoned sites. And this place that I'm talking about has been explored several times by others since. But when I visited, it wasn't a common knowledge location and all the buildings were still intact. Except for the main house which had, from what I had heard, burned down, leaving nothing but the outer stone wall. Nothing but the outer wall remains now, and all the other buildings were torn down since I was there. So, to more recent urban explorers, it's known as the Stone Castle, and more recently, the Osler Castle. This is the name given by the Heritage Society that has decided to fix it up. When my boyfriend at the time discovered it, he saw it in the distance from a roof that he was working on that day, and... There's a large barn, a carriage house, and towards the back of the property, there was also a stable. The first weekend that we both had off together, we made the hour drive to explore it. The property was absolutely stunning too. On the top of the hill back from the road, you could almost imagine living surrounded by such beauty and we did exactly that. But we lapped up the experience and it was a really nice place. But the house itself was gone, except for the wall like I said. And if you looked in the basement window, you could see an old stove sort of laying amongst the wreckage. You could tell that it had been a beautiful home at one time to whoever owned it. Being the explorer that I was, I insisted that we investigate every single corner of every single building that was on the property anyway, and although my ex was less than enthusiastic about it, I insisted. I honestly just did not see the point of driving like for an hour just to look at the outside of the buildings. No, I had to go inside of them. So, the first building we explored was the barn, both upstairs and down. Down in the basement of the barn, though, is where things went from wow to, oh my goodness, this is not good, really quickly. In the basement, it had been used as a place for what looked like sacrifices of some sort. There was satanic artwork all over, a knife with what appeared to be blood on it, and an altar with black candles, a bottle of what smelled like blood too. But the most disturbing piece was that whatever satanic group was using it, they had built a makeshift cage out of the silo with chains inside and everything. My boyfriend at the time wanted to get the heck out of there as quickly as possible, but I convinced him to stay so that we could explore the rest of the buildings on the property. I told him that it was probably just a bunch of kids just messing around, so no big deal, right? Wrong. Our next step was the stables at the back of the property and honestly I was so caught up in my love for exploring that he would have not have been able to persuade me to leave without going in every single building no matter what that I opened the door into the stable and I think it was the smell that hit me first. Rotting flesh and the entire room was littered with animal corpses. Dogs, cats, rabbits, coyotes and foxes. They had been horribly mutilated. It was absolutely, hands down, the worst thing that I've ever laid my eyes on. As soon as my boyfriend saw that, he grabbed me and said that we were leaving right at that moment, and that killing animals is not stupid kids doing stupid things. This was something serious. So we started to leave, but there was one more building, and I really wanted to check on the way out the carriage house. He said no way we were going there and stomped off up the hill back to the main house, assuming that I would follow. I didn't follow. I went around the hill by myself and took a quick peek in the carriage house. The carriage house was very anticlimactic. It had absolutely nothing in it. It's actually a good thing too that I snuck off like I did because if I hadn't, we wouldn't have seen them coming. They would have been able to sneak up on us as we were coming up the hill and do who knows what to us. The first one that I noticed was an adult male with a baseball bat. He actually had opened our car door and was rifling through things in our car, trying to find a key I'm guessing. There were about eight people in total in the group, ranging from adults I would say in their 30s to teenagers and children even no more than 12 or 13. All of them had weapons too, 
golf clubs, sticks, a cane, and baseball bats. I yelled at the guy what the heck he thought he was doing through our car, and my boyfriend came charging over the hill, bless his heart, right through the posse of creeps and weirdos who seemed to be lying in wait for us. It appeared that he had ruined whatever plans they had in mind because they immediately backed off. Some even tried to hide their weapons behind their back, which was just stupid if you ask me. Who wouldn't notice a baseball bat behind somebody's back, right? Baseball bat guy demanded to know what we were doing there, and I demanded to know what the heck they thought that they were doing in our car, but he didn't answer, just looked at me all nervous. My ex-boyfriend said we were just admiring the architecture of the house and that we were just leaving, and with that they let us get into our car and drive off, which in itself was sort of a miracle, I guess, especially in light of what we had just discovered on the property. They did follow us in a black pickup, with no plates, mind you, for a good 20 minutes. Instead of heading home, we went to the closest city, which was Barry O.N., filed a report with a policeman who seemed more shaken than us, and we headed home. My ex never went back to that roofing job again, too. He had someone else finish it, and he went to another one. I wanted to go back, but after telling people what happened, I couldn't find anyone to go with me. My ex and I continued various explorations, but we both started carrying knives after this. I still carry one to this day too, even when I hike. I have not read of anyone else having similar experiences at Satan's Castle. Recently, my cousin, who is also an explorer, contacted me with a place that she wanted to explore. And guess where it was? And guess what? We've also made arrangements to go there in the next couple of weeks. So... On that note, and many years later, Satan's Castle Cult, I really hope that that's the last that I see of you. And to any other urban explorers out there, please be careful. You just never know what you might come across in these abandoned places. I had a really weird experience in Congaree National Park outside of Columbia last winter that brought me to these kinds of places. It's a beautiful boardwalk that goes through the swamps and the cypress forest that's in them. Now, I lived in Columbia SC and frequented CNP, so I'm familiar with the area. I often would jump the fence and walk the boardwalk at night, as it's super peaceful to walk the swamp and hear all the wildlife. They never have a ranger or a guard there after hours, so I was always alone too. The last time that I did this was in October of 21, and I was taking my usual stroll with flashlights in hand. I should also mention, again, between the insects and the frogs, the sound is really loud, but then it just completely stopped when I was about a mile in. I heard what I thought was my wife call out for me from the trail ahead, but she wasn't there. I was alone and she was out of town. Suddenly I then heard water sloshing to my right and saw nothing with my flashlight. I chalked it up to just being tired and I tried to keep moving. The wildlife started up shortly after this and everything was okay. But maybe 15 minutes later I noticed it got eerily quiet again and heard swamp water sloshing on my left. But this time it was more deliberate like somebody was walking through it. I was in a thick portion of the cypress and I couldn't see more than 20 feet in front of me and then I heard my wife's voice again. Again, she wasn't with me though and she was out of town, certainly not moving through a swamp at like one in the morning. It was at this point too that I could have swore that I saw what looked like a, a human silhouette for a split second, but then it was just gone. Whatever it was, it was very skinny, pale, and taller than me at six feet. And upon seeing it, I noped the heck out of there and ran almost two miles back to my truck and didn't slow down until I heard the wildlife again. Like I said, this is a boardwalk that's in a swamp in the boonies. Nobody's walking around in the water at night without a light or ever, and I don't know of any animal that big that walks in bipedal pattern and have spent my life in the outdoors, so I would know of it. I feel that I should add that I wasn't high or sleep deprived. I just liked the woods at night. I was so freaked by this, though, that 
I came on to here and I listened to some of the stories and now I'm convinced that I encountered a crawler or a wendigo or something else that can mimic voices. There's no way that some meth head was stumbling through the swamp miles from civilization that sounds exactly like my wifey. But, and again, it is also South Carolina, so who the heck knows? I grew up in a small rural town where, well, pretty much nothing ever happens. The sort of place where it wasn't unusual to leave your doors unlocked and your closest neighbors are like a mile or so from your house. Our family also had this giant old cat, Tag, who was a bit of a drama king, but we loved him. Now, one summer when I was around maybe nine or ten years old, the cat starts going absolutely ballistic. Tag generally slept in my room, curled up next to me until I fell asleep, and then would get up to do whatever cat things that he did at night. Occasionally, he would meow or try to wake me up on unfortunate nights when he could see the bottom of his food bowl and needed a midnight snack. Usually if I ignored him, he would give up or rarely go to try and wake up my mum instead. This night, however, he bangs against my parents' bedroom door until he gets in and is meowing loud enough to wake us up. Our bedroom doors were next to each other and I call to Tag to come to bed because it's about 2am. He's having none of it though and is carrying on still. Uh, my mum gets up, goes down to the kitchen and then huffs back up with Tag on her heels still meowing insanely. She said that his bowl had plenty of food in it and he just walked her to the door of the kitchen. Tag was an indoor-outdoor cat but had his own cat door through the garage so there was no need for one of us to let him out. My mum said my brother must have left the kitchen door open and just the screen door was shut but she wasn't holding it open forever for the cat to just stand there and not go out. So she shut the kitchen door and went back to sleep, firmly shutting her bedroom door this time so Tag couldn't let himself back into her room. I always kept treats for him in my room though and offered him one but he was still meowing at their door trying to get them up. I grabbed him, bring him into my room and shut my door to try to get him to sleep. I lay in my bed trying to go back to sleep and tag meows at my door wanting back out. I finally open my door and he bolts back downstairs towards the kitchen and that's when I heard what sounded like a, a door slamming. I have three older siblings though and someone is always up watching TV or running to the bathroom so I don't really think too much of it. The cat finally stalks back into my room, but instead of curling up in my armpit like usual, he sat at the bottom of my bed just staring at my door. I fell asleep until morning when some commotion wakes me up, and I pad down to the kitchen to find my parents on the phone with the police. You see, they got up like usual to get ready for work, and while making coffee, my mum went to grab her rings from the little jewellery dish that she had by the sink because she would take them off in the evenings to rinse dishes and load the dishwasher and whatnot, but discovered that the dish was now completely empty this morning. A small town, so the sheriff sends a deputy over, and when my dad walks out to meet them, sees the ATV is missing from our back. The key is off the key ring. My brothers are all up at this point too, and we're all freaked out that while we were sleeping... Some robber must have come in and removed the ATV key and saw an opportunity to take my mum's rings. They were asking if we had any clue when it happened and my parents say no. My mum asked my middle brother who was a freshman in college and home for the summer what time he ended up off the couch last night and if he heard anything. He said that he went to bed at about 10 or 11 and asked what she meant as his bedroom was in the basement and he wouldn't have heard anything in the kitchen. She said, but you were in the living room off the kitchen when I went to feed the cat and shut the door that you left open. And I told you not to sleep on my couch and go to your bed as I, I went back upstairs. He told mum that he was apparently in the basement since dinner and never went out or came upstairs again. He watched a movie in the basement living room before going to bed in his own bedroom. She goes white and realizes that the cat must have been trying to warn us that someone had came into the house 
and the robber dove onto the couch and covered up to hide when she came to the kitchen and exited after she went back to bed. The cop said that for someone to be that brazen, they probably knew our family, knew our habits, but didn't count on the cat being so overprotective and had probably intended to steal more, but was afraid the cat may wake the whole house or something. It's been over 20 years since this happened and the robber was never caught, but it is unnerving to think that it was probably somebody who had been to our home before, as a friend perhaps. All I can say is that I thank God for our cat. So I, a 25 year old male, am into urbex. It's something that I often do alone and during the day as well, typically early dawn. And this story reaffirmed that decision for me. So one night, I was out drinking with some buddies and my hobby came up later in the night. The place that we were at was starting to die down, so they asked me if there was anywhere cool nearby that we could go to. The first place that popped into my head was an old abandoned factory that was in the woods, probably maybe five or ten minute drive away, and we went. Now, I didn't quite remember the path to get there. You have to sort of leave the trail at some point. There was also cloud cover, so visibility was super low at this point. And one of them is pretty unathletic thanks to diabetes, so I had them stay on the trail as I fumbled around in the dark to make sure that we were going in the right direction. When I finally got back, they asked how far out I went because they heard something walk by parallel to the trail. I shook it off and dismissed it, it probably was just a stray dog or something, and led them into the woods until we hit the fence. I then start leading them along the fence to the hole that somebody else cut forever ago. And when we were getting close, I begin to hear footsteps that weren't ours, maybe 15 feet to the right of us, same side as the fence, and I stopped dead in my tracks. In that moment, my entire body was screaming at me to run, and the only thing that went through my head at that moment was those were human. I turned back to my friends, and judging by the looks on their faces, they heard it too. I told my friends that we should skip this for tonight and we should head back. They quickly agreed and started back to the trail as I stayed behind to make sure that whoever was there didn't follow them. As I waited for them to get further away, I didn't hear or see anything move. And once I assumed that they were back at the trail, I took off running after them and we quickly made it back to the car in one piece. Since then, I've chalked it up to some homeless dude going to the same place to crash for the night. But it did feel like they were following us, and for whatever reason, that triggered my fight or flight super hard that night, which is really odd for me. I, a 28-year-old female, was in my first year as a physical therapist at a large hospital chain. Although I was inside of the hospital, I worked in a small outpatient clinic where patients came to me for appointments and left. As the newest therapist, I was given the late shift from 9 to 7.30 that catered to those who needed therapy and also had to work during the day. We were usually pretty slow in the evening since most of our patients were retired seniors, so I was alone after five. Like any normal day, I had a new evaluation come in for shoulder pain pretty run-of-the-mill sort of stuff. He was a middle-aged man, good-looking, well-educated, and very polite. I did the evaluation and decided to see him twice a week for six weeks. I tried to assign him to my assistant, but he refused to be treated by him, stating that he would only work with me. But that was fine. He wanted later treatment times anyways, and my assistant went home before I did. Our first few weeks of treatments go by, he was really kind and charismatic. I started to look forward to treating him as we shared a lot of the same interests. He even started waiting for me to lock up and walking out by my car in the parking garage with me. I hated the parking garage, especially when it was dark, so I welcomed him walking me to my car. At some point in our treatments, though, I noticed a, a sort of shift in him. Our light small talk started to turn a little bit more flirty, from him anyways. I was happily married and not flirting back, but 
As any woman knows, some men can confuse our niceness with flirtation. He started making advances and asking me out to drinks after therapy. I politely declined and tried to circle back to talking about his therapy. He seemed agitated by that though and started to become less and less compliant with the exercises. He stopped talking as much as well and I could just tell that the mood had shifted. This day, I decided that it would be best not to walk with him to my car. I didn't tell him this at first, so he went out of the clinic and waited by the elevator for me to lock up. I really wasn't sure what to do and couldn't call my partner as they were out of town on business. So I opened the door from the clinic to the hall where he was and told him that I had paperwork to catch up on and would see him at his next appointment. He looked at me though with such anger in his eyes and started walking faster and faster back to the door that I was at. Luckily, I was able to close the door and flip the lock before he made it to the door. He pushed the handle to try and get back in and realizing that it was locked, stepped back. Of course, this door is essentially a giant window and he would see me on the other side freaking out but trying my best to conceal it. He told me to let him inside and that he could wait with me while I finished my notes. I said thank you but I had a lot to do. He insisted and I declined again. He pushed once again on the door and when it didn't open quickly, turned around angrily and went back to the elevator. I was shaking and terrified that he would come back so I went to the private offices and locked that door as well. I grabbed a large dowel rod that wouldn't do much to him but made me feel a little bit better to have I guess. At this point... I knew that I couldn't leave as he knows where I park and what car I drive and could be waiting for me. I called security for the hospital and luckily one of the guards was doing his rounds close by and said that he would walk me to my car. We head out to my car and I see my patient parked a few spots down from me inside of his car. When he sees me and the guard walking towards my car, he backs up and pulls away. I thank the guard and get in my car. I drive a few loops before going home to make sure that I wasn't being followed. And luckily, I wasn't. Now, the next day I go to my boss and I tell her what happened. She accuses me of being paranoid and says that I need to continue to treat him. I ask her about having another therapist stay late with me and she says that she'll ask a few people but not to get my hopes up as nobody likes working the late shift. I work my normal day, dreading the next day, knowing that it is when I'm scheduled to see him again. That evening, I call my brother and ask him to come to the clinic when this patient was supposed to be there and wait in the waiting room. Thankfully, he agrees. The next day, it's time for this patient to come in and no one is there. The patient was always early to his appointment, so I was really surprised by that. 15 minutes turns to 30 and he's still not there. I decided that I would do the right thing and wait long enough, but eventually I just locked up and myself and my brother left. The weekend comes and goes, and by Monday I'm back at work. I had no messages from this patient about the no-show and had no plans to reach out to him despite that being protocol. Lunchtime rolls around and I decide to go to the hospital cafeteria to eat. There are TVs scattered all around and I sit in front of one playing the local news. I occasionally look up at it from my phone and one of the times I do, I see a familiar face. It was my patient. He was in handcuffs being walked out of his house. The sound wasn't on but I could read. His name had been arrested under suspicion of multiple murders. My jaw dropped to the floor. Now, the TV had my full attention as three pictures of young white blonde women popped up on the screen as his apparent victims. Young blonde white women that looked very similar to myself. It took a while for me to fully grasp what I had just seen, but I went to my manager and told her what I had saw, and apparently not believing me, she searched his name on Google, and sure enough, there were multiple articles and news clips talking about his arrest. She apologized to me for not listening when I expressed my concerns and told me that I could leave early if I needed. I stayed for the rest of my shift but told her that I wouldn't work late anymore by myself. By the next shift, I had one of the therapy aides assigned to stay with me until we closed. I ended up transferring to a different part of the hospital that had better hours after a few months but 
I can't help but wonder what would have happened if I had gone to get drinks with him or something, or if I had continued walking to my car with him even. I mean, I was only going to see him for a couple more weeks, so what was his plan? Was I his next target? He's still awaiting trial last I checked and hopefully will be convicted so he will be locked far away from anyone else. So my husband and father are both farmers and when they aren't in planting, spring or harvest, fall season, they're in the hay season. And well, they have just begun cutting their waterways and fields a few weeks back now they're onto client fields and waterways. My husband is in charge of cutting the hay right now while my dad has been flipping and bailing. My husband, who, let's call him Jay, pulls into his field with his tractor and hay mower. The field is really just an old pasture at an abandoned farm someone can't sell. The house is falling in, but the barn has been gone a long time thanks to a fire, and the only other thing that remains is the corn crib at the back of the property. The grass is really long and he sees tracks from a vehicle leading up to the crib. He doesn't think much of it. Kids usually trespass on abandoned properties around here to drink and whatnot anyway. Jay starts cutting the field and is almost done when some debris from either the house or the corn crib is laying in the way. Just a big metal sheet so he picks it up and decides to take it into the crib where it's out of the way. Jay starts approaching the crib when this horrible smell starts wafting into his nostrils. As he approaches, it got a lot stronger and by the time that he slides the big old wooden door open, he is gagging and has to cover his nose and mouth with his shirt. He decides to just prop the metal piece against the building while he explores for the smell. My husband is an explorer of old and odd things. Don't ask me why he did this. I would not have done this, but I'm not him. He gets to the middle of the aisle way in the crib and sees this dark goo seeping from the second level in the crib. He climbs up a few rings on the old wooden ladder to get a better view of where the goo was seeping from and sees a fresh blue tarp encompassed around something large. Flies and maggots were surrounding the goo seeping from the tarp. He turned and ran and called the cops and they told him to leave after he gave his statement. We haven't heard anything back and to be honest, I doubt we will. He didn't sleep well last night and... I'm praying, whatever was under that tarp, that it was not what we think it was. Nothing in the paper so far either. So far, all we know is that there was something dead laying in the second story of the corn crib at the old Cunningham home. This happened in 2009 to 2010. So when I met the woman who would later become my wife, we started renting a small house within the city limits. I was in the process of beginning a new job and circumstances prevented me from staying in the house with her for the first week. Each morning, we would talk on the phone during my drive to work. She explained to me each morning that she had struggled to sleep the previous night. She described sounds that were keeping her awake, like someone running through the house, objects falling off the kitchen counter, door slamming. After three days, I made arrangements to go ahead and move in with her. I was convinced that someone was breaking in and harassing her. She was convinced, however, that she was sharing the house with a ghost. I took the workday off the third day, and it took me about eight hours to get everything moved in. I was taking a break in our bed, still fully dressed, when I felt something or someone tugging on my pant leg. I remained motionless, hoping that it would happen again. After a few seconds, it did happen again, much more aggressively this time. I felt a hand firmly placed on my leg just before it grabbed my jeans and started pulling. She was on the bed next to me and nobody else was with us. We have no pets either, as it's not allowed. I immediately started having the same experiences throughout the night too, as she had described over the phone. It was like someone was destroying our kitchen, but nothing was ever out of place. There was running, as she described, which sounded like a smaller person, maybe a child. I woke up one night to someone standing next to my bed. 
I heard giggling, then the individual bolted out of the room as I turned my head. It was too dark to notice any features, and over the course of eight months, many unusual things happened. But to make a long story short, I'll skip ahead to my last experience, and perhaps the most frightening too. So, I was alone in the house waiting to join an online seminar. I was sitting on my couch with my laptop on the coffee table ahead of me. I heard the back door slam shut and a person began running quickly through the house. These steps were heavier and this person was moving quickly. Given the design of our small house, this person was running in my direction, so I shot up and ran out of the house. I didn't stop until I reached the street and that's where I remained until my wife returned. As I was standing by the street though, I was looking back into the house and a balloon from a recent party made its way from the kitchen into my bedroom, then back into the kitchen moments later. It genuinely felt like I was watching someone searching for me, going room to room, all while holding this balloon. This was the last thing that happened to us because for some really odd reason it just stopped after that. We even continued living there for another four years. I would give pretty much anything to experience it again too and I know that sounds weird but I would try to be less afraid I guess and I would approach the situation more analytically. My wife on the other hand was never afraid of it. Unfortunately my wife passed away a few years ago. I know she would have enjoyed sharing her story here too and I still drive by that house occasionally and no one has ever moved in. I was around 12 years old when this happened. I lived in a duplex that my parents owned and one day I was outside in the front yard playing with my dogs. The house was located in a neighborhood that's right by a busy main road, so during the daily rush hour the area got pretty busy. Thank God for this too because as I was busy with my dogs, I noticed a black car in front of my house that kept inching forward a little and sort of backing up a little bit too. I noticed the driver leering at me in a creepy way and got a really bad feeling so I ran up the stairs to where I lived with my parents. I told my mother about what had happened and I have no idea what was going through her mind at this time because she didn't really seem at all that concerned. A few minutes later she sent me to the grocery store that was a block away and after griping about that to her I went walking to the store. The duplex is across the street from a bank and next to the bank, on the other side of the wall by the drive-up tellers, was an alley that also led to the store. I decided to take the bank route because I felt safer and as I was walking by the ATM, thankfully there was a line of people waiting to use it. Who do I see but that same creepy guy in his car parked at the bank in front of the ATM. I kept my eyes on him as I walked past his car and... He was leaning forward with his hands on the wheel, ogling me and licking his lips, which was really gross. I got out of there as quickly as I could and I ran the rest of the way to the store. As I was walking out of the exit while leaving the store, I saw my brother waiting for me outside. He told me to get in and drove me home. He had been listening to what I told our mum about the guy outside the house and reamed her out for making me walk to the store alone knowing that this guy was lurking around in the neighbourhood. To this day, I still get chills knowing how close I came to potentially being, well, who knows what. It makes me sick to even think about it, to be honest, and I've been meaning to tell this story here for a while now, but like I said, every time that I even so much as think about it, uh, about what could have happened, I just feel sick. My younger sister and I have always dreamed of visiting New Zealand. Both of us being from the southeastern United States, New Zealand seemed like a perfect getaway where our favourite trilogy was filmed. So with months of saving and planning, it was the spring of 2017 that we flew to Auckland, New Zealand for a grand adventure. It was the second day of our trip and we were about to head out from our Airbnb. Our gracious Airbnb host made us breakfast of bacon, eggs and toast 
We were munching on the breakfast he prepared in silence until he broke the lull by asking us, Hey, uh, have you heard of the pig man? My sister and I sort of looked at each other and then I responded with, No, who is the pig man? Stu is his name and he's kind but he's a really peculiar guy with droves of pigs. If you take the 309 road, you'll pass this place and the pig's on your route to your next destination. It's quite the novelty if you're looking for something to do. We'll make sure to add that to our trip, I said while sort of looking at my sister. Would you ladies like some more toast? My sister and I both said yes, knowing that we'd need the extra calories for the long day ahead. You girls eat like farm girls, and he oinked at us twice. He said it in a playful tone, but... Again, my sister and I sort of looked at each other, but this time sort of exchanging curious glances. We thanked our host for our wonderful stay at his Airbnb, and we were on our way to Matamata. After what seemed to be only a few hours of driving, we come across a dirt road. The environment changed from only greenery and trees to old vehicles, other old structures embedded in the landscape, as well as an eye-catching feature, a plethora of pigs. The pigs appeared friendly enough to pet, but we were in a hurry, so we drove past the pig farm and onto Matamata. It wasn't long after that that we had to take a sharp left onto a narrow road. Keep in mind, too, that this is my third day driving on the left side of the road ever, and in a Yaris, so my driving abilities weren't quite up to snuff. And as I'm taking the left turn, a small semi-truck was incoming at a rather unsafe speed. I quickly realized that we are either going into a full-on head collision or drive even further to the left to allow the semi-truck to pass us safely. I acted on the latter of the options and within seconds, the Aris's front and back left tires were trapped in a large set of potholes. My sister and I both sort of looked at each other in silence until she said, uh, Now what? We did not have any cell phone reception and the only full operable device that we had was a GPS which didn't have any outgoing communication functionality. So rather than panic, we get outside of the Yaris to assess how he can get the car out of the pothole. It wasn't long too before we saw a white utility van driving towards our seemingly helpless situation. We had mixed emotions about gesturing the driver of this van to stop. We were in a foreign land about to rest our fate in a stranger's hands and that just didn't really seem safe. But without even motioning the van to stop, the vehicle pulled over and nothing really happened for several minutes. We patiently waited to see who would open the driver's door of the van and when the driver finally presented themselves, it was an older man with white hair in his mid-sixties who appeared to be a local farmer. He looked at us with a smile, revealing a few missing teeth as he walked towards us. My sister and I telepathically made the decision to allow this stranger to approach us, given that we had no other solution to our situation. The silence broke when he said, with what seemed to be an Australian accent, G'day ladies, seems like you found yourselves in a situation. I put on a brave smile and responded with, yes we have, we're figuring out how we can get the car safely out of the pothole without damaging it. I was conscientious in making sure to omit details about us being tourists, but I'm sure my accent and apparel gave it away to some extent. Well, uh, I'm not sure I can be much help with that, but I can get you a lift into town for someone to tow the car. How about that? Well, I'd like to at least attempt in getting the car out before involving anyone else. Uh, thanks. He looked displeased for a moment and then turned on a smile once more. Now, think. The three of us won't be able to get that car out of the hole. It would be best if you and your friend hop in my ride and we drive you to town. It won't take long. Without even needing to consult with my sister, we both knew that this was a bad idea. The man said with a bit more urgency and slight vexation in his voice, The way I look at it, you're better off coming with me than staying here to see what others will do to you. We both were anxious and fearful of what he may physically do to us, Terrifying thoughts popped into my head, like if our family and friends would even hear from us again, or if newspaper headlines will read, two female travelers kidnapped and killed just around the pig pen. To our surprise, another van approached the scene and parked behind the old man's vehicle. It was a woman with grey hair and athletic build, about in her 40s or early 50s. There you ladies are, I've been looking for you for the past hour or so. 
My sister and I had absolutely no idea who this woman was, but we followed her lead. She seemed far more trustworthy than this irritable Aussie. It wasn't long after the lady walked towards us that the Aussie shied away and made quickly to his vehicle. He hopped in his van and he drove off. I saw from a distance that he was talking to you and made you feel uncomfortable. Are you ladies okay? The woman asked. We said yes and went on to explain how we ended up in the pothole. We told her that we were extremely fortunate that she showed up when she did. It was almost fate that we met this woman, in fact. She worked in construction and just so happened to have a board that we used as a ramp for the tires and a rope to pull the Yaris out as well. We successfully unstuck the car and thoroughly thanked our rescuer. We did offer her money, but she refused. She only wished that we heed her advice and... She told us to be wary of devilish pigs on your travels. Not all of them are as friendly as stews. When I was 17, I started to see a woman out of the corner of my eye, and it started happening more frequently. I should note that I had lived in this house since I was five and in particular I always felt something in the basement and would absolutely bolt up the stairs every time that I was leaving it. Anyway, I started seeing her more and more frequently but any time that I turned to get a good look, she was just gone. Then one random night, I was sitting on the couch long after everyone had gone to bed and I saw her again but... Then she started chasing me and I bolted up to the second floor where my bedroom was. I had to sleep with every light in my room on that night and slept completely underneath the covers because I just knew that whatever was in the basement was now under my bed. I slept with the lights on every night for a week because I was convinced if I didn't that it would kill me. The paranoia and the lights on for days happened a few more times over the years but only ever in that house and nowhere else. Honestly, I realize that it's very possible that it was just a psychotic break because the shadow figures in my vision still show up when I'm really, really stressed and same with auditory hallucinations of people calling my name. But it's been about two years since I've had any though and I've never seen a figure as clearly as I did that day. So, I was babysitting two younger cousins at their home, which was about a hundred years old and it was also situated next to a graveyard. There wasn't necessarily a bad feeling in the house whenever we were there, but it was a bit creepy at night looking at all of the headstones. Anyway, I was helping the girls brush their teeth and whatnot before bed, and I headed back downstairs after they were in their beds and I had said goodnight. I sat down and almost immediately I heard a commotion of like doors not slamming but shutting hard and the girls I believe that they were around four or six at the time talking loudly when I got upstairs they were at the end of the hallway around a corner and they were pushing their hands against the door to the attic as if trying to keep someone or something from coming through we gotta shut it help us shut it they half shouted and sort of half whispered I'm already on edge because of the house and the stories my aunt and uncle had shared with us regarding paranormal activity. And so when I put my hand against the old heavy attic door, I absolutely freaked out when I definitely felt something pushing back from the other side. I paused for a moment in shock and then quickly and forcefully slammed it shut. And I mean, thank goodness, right? The girls thanked me as if this were like a normal bedtime thing for them and went back to their rooms to go to sleep. As for me, I noped the heck out back downstairs. My aunt and uncle returned later that evening and I mentioned it to my uncle as he drove me home. He just kind of chuckled and said something to the effect of, yeah, sounds about right. I have a few more incidences from this particular house if anyone's interested, but for now, that's my story and it's by far the freakiest thing that I've ever experienced. I spent my late childhood and early adulthood in this house situated in a nature reserve in Brazil. Several weird things happened here and 
Uh, there was like a, a snake that mysteriously showed up in my fully closed room, mind you. Missing objects here and there, trees that seemed misplaced from one day to the next. But one thing kind of stands out. Now, I should start off by saying that I'm pretty cynical, I guess. I'm an atheist and I don't really believe in the paranormal, myself anyway. I usually explain away all the stuff that happened. The snake, the crack in the foundation of the house, likely got in like that. Objects missing, I probably lost them outside the house. Trees moving, I just misremembered where they were. That said, this one was weird. So this one night, I was just staring up at the stars. A benefit of living in a nature reserve is the lack of public lighting. And my dogs started freaking out and barking. Now, it was a new moon night, so it was pretty dark, so I couldn't really see much. But the dogs really, really barked unprompted like that. So I got up from where I sat to go check on what they were barking at. To my mind, it was probably just one of the little creatures we sometimes got visits from. Armadillos, mice, opossums. But man, I was way wrong. So at first, at the edge of the property, I saw what looked like a deer. The kind that I knew only was from like American horror movies, I guess, with antlers and stuff. But that was really weird too, because... To my knowledge, those don't really exist below the equator, but alright, I tell the dogs to shush, thinking something along the lines of, oh, it must just be the plants, nothing to worry about. But things start to move. You see, it actually stands up over the fence that we had there. Mind you, the fence was like two meters tall, so this thing is absolutely massive. And as soon as it's upright, it let out this sort of bleat that sounded like a woman's scream. In the split second that it did this, I just ran with the dogs inside the house and sheltered myself under the table. Eventually, I came out from there and looked around. But after that, I never saw that thing again. Thank God, too. And needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night. So some backstory first. I was fresh out of high school and found my first job working as a dialysis tech at an outpatient clinic. I'd always wanted to go into nursing and thought that this would make for some great experience while I waited to get into the nursing program at the local college. One of my co-workers at the clinic was also straight out of high school and interested in nursing and we instantly clicked. This was around 2008 and shows like ghost adventures were all the rage. We were both pretty hooked and would go to the local cemeteries at night and whatnot, looking for ghosts. The only thing that we ever really accomplished, though, was scaring the heck out of ourselves, to be honest. I'm not sure who thought of it first, but one of us got the bright idea to investigate the clinic that we worked at. Obviously, patients had passed away before during their treatments, so it seemed logical to me that they may still be there. So one night after work... We both stayed behind after everyone else had left. I started taking pics on my terrible digital camera, and she was doing the flashlight test trying to get a response. We got nothing. But after a while, we're just sort of mucking around and honestly about to give up when my friend starts calling out a patient of ours that had recently passed away while on the machine. She had been a sweet elderly lady who was also a, a DNR, and her death was actually pretty uneventful. Well, my friend tries to provoke this old woman and starts saying things like, I never really liked you. When out of nowhere, an oxygen tank standing in a metal case began to shake violently on its own. The tank was literally standing by itself. Nothing near it was even capable of movement. I didn't know what to think, and to be honest, I really wasn't expecting anything, but to see this really shocked me. Needless to say... We got out of there and didn't stick around after closing anymore after that. I'm pretty skeptical of most things, but I have no doubt in my mind that something was there with us that night and still cannot find an explanation as to how that tank could have possibly shaken itself like that without the influence of some unseen force. So 
So I took my sister, visiting from out of state, on a hike the other day in a rural part of the state that I live in. But lots of trees, waterfalls, very little cell phone signal, you get the picture. I'd already had some weird feelings when I saw another car already parked where the trailhead was at, because we got there on a weekday at 6.30 in the morning. But I brushed it off, quieted my intuition, because the early bird gets the worm, right? There were several different trails in this natural area, and so we started on the one that sounded most interesting. We got maybe a quarter mile down the trail when my sister stepped into a spider web. As she was wrestling with getting it off of her, I felt something that I can best describe as a, a hot breath hit my ear coming from nowhere. And I don't think that I heard a whisper, but I had a thought that wasn't my own that I thought was get out. Now that I've had some time to really think about it too, I think it actually said get help. I told my sister what just happened and her natural response was, oh maybe we should leave. We started making our way back out to the trailhead, but just as we were getting ready to leave, I swear that I felt something pulling me back in. I convinced her to let us try a different trail. I looked at the sign listing the different trails and again intuition told me to take the next one and we started down. It was supposed to be a loop that led down by the river with some falls. The trail hadn't been traveled in at least a day, and I know this because of all the spider webs blocking the path. We got down to the river, and there's a detour with a bridge going across to the other side. I walk across and get down to it, and there's a, a sweater hanging on the rail. I go to look at it, but I can't really bring myself to touch it. We took a few pictures because it was really pretty, but I just couldn't shake the weird feeling of what I was getting. I kept writing it off as being hungry and tired because I skipped breakfast that morning and went to bed late the night before. But in any case, we got back up and continued a little further down the trail and get to a fork in the trail. My sister wants nothing to do with this path because it wasn't marked like the other one was, but being a naturally curious person, trying to see some more pretty scenery I guess... I decide that I want to go down a little ways and see what I can see. I get to a spot where I see a much lighter spider in a very pretty web that I could tell took a while, so I stopped to admire it. And it was at this moment that, for no apparent reason, I felt uneasy enough to want to turn back around, and so I did. We took the other path and the fork a little bit further in, and as we're walking through a certain spot, I get a whiff of something but don't really think too much of it. I notice the time on my phone and we begin to turn around so I can get back home in time for work. On our way back I get stuck in a spider web and as I'm wrestling myself out of it the smell comes back and it suddenly clicks that it's the unmistakable stench of death. My little sister has never had to smell it so she thought that I was just being paranoid I could have written it off as, oh, we're in the woods, it could just be a dead possum or a deer nearby. That kind of thing is super common here. But for some reason, I just can't shake it. I call the local non-emergency number and tell them that there's a smell and they say that they'll send some officers out. I also take a screenshot of my Google Maps location because for some reason in that spot, that exact spot of all places, I have service. My sister wants to leave for obvious reasons. She has jitters and we have to go meet the officers at the trailhead so we start making our way out. And it's on our way out that I feel another hot breath on my ear and I get a really sick feeling. We meet the officers and I give my sister the keys so she can go and sit in the car in the AC. That way I know that she's somewhere safe. When some guys from the fire department get there... We drive down to another trail entrance that was a little closer to the river and I use the screenshot of my map to guide us back to where the smell is. From there, this group of about eight police and firefighters are digging around with heat sensing equipment to try and locate whatever the smell is. As they're searching, I'm kind of just sort of standing there being useless to be honest because I figure stay out of the way and let them do their job. I stand facing the direction of the river and I feel what feels like thumbs on the back of my head like someone is standing behind me flicking my head with their finger to get my attention at one point one guy with a heat sensor not sure what they're actually called but it's like a, a camera that reads heat or whatever 
picks up what looks like a humanoid blob of heat and someone else goes over to where it is and there's nothing there. They write it off as something underground or maybe the sunshine through the trees on the ground or something. And as they're getting ready to write it off as a, a dead animal somewhere, a few decide to go a quick once over by the river just to cover all bases. They take the path that I turned around at where the giant spider was at and it led down to a, a sort of a steep drop off. I'm walking out with the rest of the officers when I hear one of them yell for everyone else. And would you believe that there is a body in the river? I know it sounds weird too, but I felt instant relief, which I know sounds odd considering the situation, but it was like a weight had been lifted off of me. Whoever they were, they were found. They can be put to rest and I can breathe again. When I got home, I take a shower and sit down for work. My cat does everything that she can to lay on me, put all of her weight on me and purr so loudly that she seems like she's trying to comfort and heal me. I know that they can pick up on things and so I think she's just trying to help me. I know it sounds cliche too, but the whole finding a body in the woods thing is a, a very B-rate horror movie. I know none of you know me from Adam, but I swear that this happened. I don't really know how to move past it too. I don't know what I experienced and I would love to know that I'm not alone.